בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, we are back in our Wednesday night, שיעור תורה, סתם תו רבי, where uh, after a little bit of דברי תורה, and חיזוק, you guys will ask some questions, ובעזרת השם הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us the answers. Uh, so uh, tonight's uh, שיעור is uh, for a uh, רפואה שלמה for רבנית uh, לבנה בת שרה. רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, דוד בן עשריה, דוריס בת ז'ורה, אורית בת אילנה, and also for a הצלחה רבה for אבי מורי, דוד בן נשריה, דוריס בת ז'ורה, אושרי בן דוריס, גבי בן דוריס, אלעד בן דוריס, מרשה בת ג'ולי, איילה בת מרשה, סמיר בן מרשה, ספס בן מרשה, אלכזנדר בן מרשה, לואיס בן מרשה, שאול בן פרזנה, ראובן חיים בן פאלה פארל, נתנאל יוסף בן אברהם, אין אמיר בן שאהין. And all of the other wonderful people that uh, continue to uh, contribute, whether it's for the sake of uh, getting uh, brachot to the Siyat Adishmaya, or it's uh, for the sake of uh, simply being part of a uh, major... Uh, Kiruv uh, organization that's trying to do everything possible to help people get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, regardless of uh, where they started. So uh, this week we have Parashat Lech Lecha. Parashat Lech Lecha is uh, where we're introduced to Avram Avinu. I mean, he's first mentioned as Avram in uh, the end of last week's Parashat Noach, uh, but that's really just his birth. And then later on we get into Parashat Lech Lecha where we start getting to know our forefather, Avraham Avinu, the Kodesh Kodeshim, Malach Hashem, that uh, he was, and uh, really uh, the, the ultimate Baal Emuna. And uh, really, when one of the uh, main things that uh, a person can learn from the entire Sefer Bereshit, the entire Sefer Bereshit, all of the uh, different uh, avot that we get to meet, is how to be what's called Yashar. Yeshav, this is how to be a straight person, an honest person, a person with integrity. By simply looking, reviewing, studying the actions of our forefathers and how they were and how they acted. But also understand that we, the Torah was really their guidebook. How do you know that Torah was their guidebook? You know, because some of the naysayers would like to think that, uh, you know, they didn't have the Torah because... But the, the, the parashat of Matan Torah is parashat Yitro, which is at the time of uh, the lifetime of Moshe Rabbeinu, not the time of Avraham Avinu. But how do we know that uh, Avraham Avinu fulfilled the entire Torah, just like the Gemara says? You simply look at his life. You look at the, uh, the life of all of the Avot that are mentioned, and you see how they live their life. And it's simply uh, impossible to live such a life if you don't have an oral Torah it's being taught to you and in essence obligating you to act this way. Where the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that uh, after uh, a person completes their uh, time frame in this world, uh, good, whether for good or for bad, the, uh, they go up to the Bed Din of Shemaim and at the Bed Din of Shemaim, uh, the uh, Gemara says that uh, they ask you questions. Yeah, before the judgment comes, they ask you questions. And the first... Uh, uh, questions are, did you conduct your business dealings with emunah? Did you conduct your business with emunah? Meaning that, did you operate your day-to-day -day life, whether it's day-to-day -day life and how you paid your bills, day-to-day -day life of how you ran your business, day-to-day -day life of how you were as far as your honesty when it comes to your customers or your employers or your employees. Did you have emunah? Meaning that did you have uh, did you show that you understand that there is a eye that's watching, an ear that's hearing, and a hand that's writing everything that you're doing in Shemaim at all given times? That there is Ashkechapatit, there is divine providence at all times, watching and recording every single thing that you do. And really, when a person starts looking at themselves, they could start uh, really. Uh, uh, questioning how much emunah they really have by simply reviewing themselves and their actions. Because if we all 
uh, were as scared of the uh, of the police of of Hashem as much as we are of men or of the like the police, then we would simply never make a sin. That's in essence what the uh, Rabbi Yochanan says to his Talmidim, that uh, when they asked him uh, to teach him something before he leaves this world, he says, "May you be as scared of Hashem as you are of people." And one of the examples is, you know, when people are uh, driving on a highway and all of a sudden there's a, uh, a police siren behind them, they're not even sure if it's meant for them or it's not, but immediately a person's heart starts pumping. If they get a, uh, uh, you know, a letter in the mail from some tax office or some lawyer, immediately their hearts start pumping. They're not really sure, am I guilty, am I innocent? They're not even sure what they're being accused of yet. Uh, but yet, as soon as they see these names, these government offices, these uh, superior, your boss shows up, uh, somebody that's a, uh, in intimidating is uh, in your presence, immediately our hearts start pumping. But the reality is, Rabbi Karim, that no matter how impressive and scary your boss or your customer or the police officer or the government is uh no one is like a kadosh baruch Hu, but we don't act that way most of the time simply because we forget and that's actually one of the gifts that hashem gave us uh is uh, is the torah to remind us to remind us that you learn torah day and night you have to make a time to learn some torah in the morning you have to make some time to learn torah at night uh, surely it's a, our uh, privilege and honor that uh, some of you use our shulim as part of your limud, uh, and uh, that's uh, perfectly fine. Uh, but of course, if a person wants to continue advancing and get closer and closer to Hashem, uh, they need to learn the halachot, they need to learn the laws themselves. Uh, you know, for Jews, we have a whole uh, slew of books that will teach you how to apply the, uh, the Torah to your day-to-day life. And, and one of the main things that Chachamim teach us is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to bring merit to Am Yisrael and therefore he gave them many mitzvot. Many mitzvot. Now, uh, Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin asks his Rebbe, the Gaon Mivilna, Kvod Arav, if changing our character traits and improving ourselves, improving our Yirat Shamaim, improving our, uh, uh, you know, our, our flaws, uh, you know, not being angry anymore, not being stingy, not being... Uh, arrogant and so on and so forth if all of these things were so important why isn't there a mitzvah in the torah that says so now technically obviously there is a mitzvah the one of the uh, the fourth mitzvah on the rambam is to fear of the almighty uh so that is a mitzvah but nonetheless the rest of the character traits as far as anger and stinginess and so on there isn't a particular mitzvah that says that you are not allowed to be angry and you're not allowed to be stingy and so on. There is mitzvahs that imply it, but there isn't a mitzvah specifically says so. But yet we all know it's an obligation, it's a chok. And so the Gaomi Vilna says to them, it says to his Talmud, the reason why the Torah doesn't specify each and every character trait that you need to improve is simply because the whole point of all of the mitzvot, all 620 mitzvot, 613 biblical and, and seven uh, rabbinical mitzvot, which is with countless alachot, thousands of alachot, uh, you know, that, that come from them, that stem from them. The point of all of these mitzvot is for a person to use those mitzvot in order to perfect their character traits. In order to perfect their character traits. So when a person goes up to Shamayim, as we learned from the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, and he's asked, did you conduct your business with Emunah? It's really not a question. Why? Because that's the only thing that they did. Before they did everything, they checked, is this allowed or is this not allowed? Is Hashem going to be proud of me or is Hashem going to be mad at me? Because he's watching as we speak. It's not like he's gonna fi- Hashem's going to find out later on. Hashem sees this business deal right now. Hashem sees me procrastinating right now. Hashem sees me being generous right now. Hashem sees everything that I'm doing right now. Is Hashem that is watching me right now and writing everything that I'm doing in my own book, my own personal book of my life that's in essence going to be shown to me when I go up to Shemaim. Is Hashem writing a check next to it, this is good, or a uh, ugly X mark that, uh, that's bad? What is Hashem really writing in my book right now? So if a person truly asks themselves, these questions before every one of their actions, that first and foremost shows that they're fulfilling the mitzvah, the, the mitzvah of Yirat Shemaim, the fear of the Almighty. But aside from that, they're also 
giving themselves a major, major uh, uh, preparation for the next world, for the eternal world. And we know that Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, all of our avot, all the shvatim, the, uh, the tribes, implemented this in their lives. And you can see it from the stories of their lives, if you will, uh, where you see little sparks of their life uh, coming through the Torah, through the written Torah, endless amount more coming from the oral Torah, from the Midrashim, from uh, the, uh, the Gemarot, and so on. And of course, anyone that learns the different Gemarot or the different Midrashim knows that there are at times different opinions about different things. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a majority opinion on the, uh, the, you know, the most things. Of course, the things that have nafkamina, meaning they have an halachic implication. There is a uh, universal acceptance of one particular thing. But there are certain things that there isn't a uh, alachic implication and therefore it's perfectly fine to believe one or the other opinion. Uh, for example, one thing that somebody asked me the other day is, uh, isn't it uh, true that uh, it says that Esav, Esav uh, 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 killed Nimrod? And uh, the answer is 100% it's true uh, because that's what the Midrash says. But then there's another Midrash that says that Avram Avinu, as part of his war against the four kings, he actually killed Nimrod as one of the kings. So how could this be? How could one Midrash say this and another Midrash say something else? The answer is the vast majority of Midrashim say that actually it is. It is a, uh, 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 correct that Esav killed Nimrod. It is correct that Esav killed Nimrod, but there is at least one Midrash uh, that I just uh, found out about this week that says that Avram actually killed Nimrod. Now, can you believe one or the other? You can believe either one. Why? Simply because there's no nafkamina. There's no change as far as halachic implications or change in your day-to-day -day life of whether you believe this one or that one. Of course, the things that do have a nafkamina, that have a major meaning, a person needs to go to their Rav and know what exactly uh, has to be uh, uh, applied and, and, and go by. But we see from Avram Avinu and how he lived his life that everything that we uh, just mentioned was not just known to him, but was simply that was him. That was him. He fulfilled the entire Torah. As the Gemara in Masechet Abu Dazara says that Avram Avinu had 400, tra 400 uh, chapters in his tractate of Abu Dazara. In his tractate of Abu Dazara, he had 400 uh, chapters. Now today's, uh, if you pick yourself up a, uh, a tractate of Abu Dazara in the Talmud Bavli, you're going to see that uh, we don't have anywhere near as much uh, chapters. Uh, barely, to, you know, not even 5% uh, 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 of the amount of chapters. So our Gemara today, our oral Torah today, is much, much smaller than what Avraham Avinu had. And that's a, uh, one of the reasons is because... When we think of Abu Dazara, we think of, oh, it's an idol, it's Christianity, it's uh, Buddhism, it's uh, perhaps it's money, uh, you know, all types of things like that. But also, Abu Dazara is serving anything foreign, meaning anything that's not Hashem. And sometimes that's, that foreign servitude is a bad character trait. It's a bad character trait. It's you're serving your anger, you're serving your ego. All of these different things were part of Avraham Avinu's oral Torah and much, much more. Avraham Avinu had a uh, tractate of Abu Dazara that it literally was bigger than our entire Talmud. But nonetheless, this is something that in this is, uh, was just part of his Torah, not the whole thing. And we see from his life how he applied these things. And that's some of the things we'll go on into today. And also to see or hear a few good stories of, uh, of some things that will help give us some chizuk to hold us and to give us the, the strength to overcome the, uh, uh, the di different uh, tri trials and tribulations uh, that uh, we have for the rest of the week and, uh, and beyond. Now, in the beginning of the parasha, we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, gives a, uh, Avram Avinu a major blessing that all of the nations of the world are familiar with until this day. That I will bless those who bless you and uh, curse those that uh, who curse you. Uh, or those who curse you, I will curse them. 
this is one of the blessings that Am Yisrael has that is in essence uh, not only shows how Hashem favors Am Yisrael among all of the nations, but even more so warns all of the nations not to go against Am Yisrael, not to hurt Am Yisrael. And you see throughout history, you don't have to uh, be religious to, uh, to, to see uh, a confirmation of what I'm about to say. Simply, you look throughout all of history, you look throughout all of history, and you see all of the different countries that at a period of time hosted, you know, Am Yisrael, where they allowed us to not only live there, but to live there freely, to be able to practice uh, Judaism, to follow the Torah, and you see how during those times, every single one of those nations, without exception, prospered. Every single one of those nations, whether it was the Babylonians or it was the uh, 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 the Spanish, the the Turkish, the uh, 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 the Italian, uh, even China had a uh, very uh, uh, decent sized uh, community at some point. Uh, you see what uh, in, in Europe. And uh, of course, you see today, uh, you see in America, every country that allowed the Jewish people to prosper succeeded in a very, very big way. I mean, just look at what happened after they kicked us out. You know, after the Spanish kicked us out, the Spanish Inquisition, which one of the biggest tragedies that happened in the last 500 years for Am Yisrael, this was also the biggest, the biggest tragedy that happened to the Spanish people. Why? Because from the time, you know, the day before they kicked us out, the Spanish were in essence the top of the world. Top of the world leading in every aspect. Top of the world. The day after they kicked us out, simply it was a downward spiral. And today, no one actually uh, is, uh, you know, uh, 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 remembering uh, the Spanish for any major achievements that, uh, that have happened in, in the last 500 years. No one is uh, considering the uh, Spain as their main uh, uh, place where this is the main place I have to rely on for my Parnassa. Uh, of course, good country, it has some Jews there to this day and uh, they're uh, you know, uh, relatively peaceful and so on. But again, the blessing and the superiority that they had when the Jewish people were in essence a, a dominant force there was extraordinary. And I don't mean the blessing on the Jews, uh, I'm talking about the blessing on the Goim. The blessing on the Goim when Am Yisrael was, was in Spain was extraordinary. Same exact thing with, uh, with uh, 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 Bavel, with Iraq. Iraq had a huge, huge uh, Sephardi community over there, extraordinary Sephardi community over there. Uh, some of the greatest tzaddikim that ever lived, you know, built, built the, uh, the, uh, the Torah world. Uh, in, in different communities there, the Talmud Bavli obviously came from there. You have major tzaddikim uh, that, uh, that were there. And you saw during that time, the country prospered. The Goim prospered. Major uh, uh, things, good things happened over there. As soon as that uh, stopped, who remembers Iraq for any good thing at all, Period. The, the, the last thing the last thing they remembered for is for the evil leader they had, uh, Saddam Hussein in Machshimo, that was killing his own people and any uh, and anybody else that he could. That's what you remember Saddam Hussein for. That's it. That's you don't remember Iraq for anything else that's of any value. And again, the same thing you will find in every other country. Germany uh, had a, uh, a, a, a at one point a very significant size of uh, Jewish people. They prospered, even though many of those Jews intermarried, became ca Catholics, and, but the, nonetheless, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Germans prospered as a result. After the Holocaust, obviously it took uh, the Germans many, many years to get back on the map altogether, and, but until this day, Germany is nowhere near what it used to be as far as their significance on the tolling pole. And the same thing goes with every country. This is part of this blessing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Am Yisrael, beginning with Avraham Avinu. Those that bless you will be blessed. Those that curse you will be cursed. And we're seeing, we're seeing this happening even in our own Eretz HaKodesh, our own uh, 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 Israel today. Modern Israel is run by a bunch of atheists, heretics, haters of the Torah, do everything possible to torture the Torah world, to hurt the Torah world, 
And we see how it's actually hurting the people. You see that the, the crime level in Israel is literally at all-time highs. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a thing, something that I read about, I watched a documentary about uh, a while ago, about how there is a uh, drug, there's a new drug in America uh, that uh, is literally so lethal that it's worse than the worst things that we've ever heard of as children, heroin and crack and all of those other filthy, disgusting things that people put into their body, the poisons that people put into their body. And this new drug that's in the market now is so bad that in order to try to convince people to get off of it, you actually give them crack. That's how bad it is. When your recovery is crack, you're in bad shape. Now, why would people do this? Why would the government actually do this? Pay for this crack, pay for this? To, because it's either you're going to continue accumulating more and more bodies, literally in the middle of the street in Seattle and uh, that, that has a huge community over there of people that are just literally dying in the streets every single day from this drug. And there's no way to stop it. Why there's no way to stop it? Because this drug is so horrible not just because of the, the fact that it kills people first time that they take it many times, even if they're drug addicts for their whole life, but literally you can't stop this drug from going into the market because the, 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 the chemicals that are in it are perfectly legal and you can buy them on the internet. So much so that a person could literally go buy these things on the internet for a few hundred dollars and turn that into 10 or 20 or $30,000 or $100,000, some ridiculous number of something they bought on the internet. Now, don't get any ideas because any of you that decides to do one of these things, you could simply kiss your, your Allah Abba goodbye because you're going to be a murderer of all of those people. Now, of course, I have to mention these things, even though I know that most of you are tzaddikim, simply because the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the obligation is to warn people at all times for the things that they think of and the things that their Yetzirah is thinking of. But nonetheless, this particular drug is in the market. It's in America. It's literally killing people every single day. And there's literally trucks going through the communities in Seattle, and I'm sure in other places in America, but the documentary was specifying Seattle over there. And literally, they're accumulating bodies every day. Every day, they're taking bodies off the street, burying them. Bodies on the street, burying them, or burning them, or whatever they're doing with them. And there's a whole recovery center where the, the, uh, the, they're giving people crack. It's the most insane thing in the world, or heroin, or whatever it is. Some horrible drug they're giving them to, to get out of this thing. Now... The, the, the damage that I saw when I first saw this, I'm like, wow, this is mamash terrible. Like, you know, I knew about drugs when I was a kid, never took them, Baruch Hashem, but I knew about, you know, if somebody smoked marijuana, if somebody took pills, somebody took all this filth in their life, and I, I knew some people that overdosed and died and so on, but this is like a whole new level, a whole new level, only to find out that this very same thing is running rampant in Eretz Israel, Hashem Ishmo Vietzin. This is in Eretz Israel. They, I believe they call it uh, Mr. Nice Guy. They make this poison sound so good. They make the packaging on it look like it's a toy. Look like it's some candy. And it's a mamash. It's unbelievable. And there are literally young jewish boys and girls dying every single day from this filth entire streets full of this and the police are scared to go into these streets scared to go in these streets why would the chosen nation be suffering from such a curse you don't have to look and think too much when you have a government when you have a leadership that is so anti-torah Surely they're not going to receive the same blessing that they're supposed to be getting since the time of Avraham Avinu. Further after this, we see that Avraham Avinu is a Mezakeh Rabim, he's a Kiruv machine, the first Kiruv machine in history, where it says when uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu tells him to, uh, to leave, to leave the, uh, the, the, uh, the land that he was uh, born in, the land where his relatives are, the land of his father's house, to go leave this uh, place, and go somewhere else, it says that Avram took his, uh, his wife Sarah, he took Lot, his, uh, his, a, uh, uh, his um, a nephew, but he also took all the souls that they made in Haran. What souls did they make in Haran? 
all of those people that would come to Avraham Avinu and ask him for food, be hosted by Avraham Avinu, there was one price. What was the price? Listen to Divrei Torah. Listen to the Divrei Torah, say blessing to Hashem, thanking Hashem for the food. That was the price. And all of those people, the second they heard Avraham Avinu talk Torah to them, that's it. That's all you have to do. One, one, one little speech. One little speech, they did tshuva, they left, the, they abandoned the idolatry, and they became monotheistic. So all of those souls were considered as if Avraham created those souls, because that's what the Gemara says. When you help another person do tshuva, it's considered as if you are a partner with Akadosh Baruch Hu himself, as if you created that person. Because until now, this person was gifted tools, but all he was doing was destroying those tools. He was gifted a soul, he's destroying the soul. Was gifted a mind, he's destroying that mind. Was gifted a body, destroying that body. And in essence, making themselves worse than the animal. Worse than the animal in the zoo. Where the animal is serving its purpose, but the person is not serving their purpose. Now, when you got this person to abandon their bad ways and do tshuva and get close to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, you're in essence creating that person. You're creating a new person, a new opportunity, a new a person that actually has a share in the world to come, a person that has an, a, 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 the a knowledge, ability, and desire to use their body, their mind, their heart, their soul to serve their creator. They know their creator. You created that person. Now, whether you... Uh, gave a speech and that encouraged that person to do tshuva or you gave them a USB or a CD or a flyer or you invited them to watch a shiur or you sent them a link. None of that matters how you did it. However you did it, you did it, you got that person to do tshuva, that's it. You bought yourself another share of Olam Abba. You bought yourself another share of Olam Abba. But that's the problem. Many people don't understand the value of Olam Abba. They don't understand because we work, we like to talk about how Allah ba, heaven, 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 heaven. But in reality, all of the efforts that a person usually puts into their life is for this world. We like to talk about how, you know, there is a heaven. We don't like to talk about Gainom. We don't like to talk about punishment. We like to talk about how everybody's going to heaven. But all of the efforts, the resources, the time is spent on building this world. He spent time building a bigger house in this world. He spent time getting a nicer car or two in this world. He spent time getting a vacation house in this world. He spent time looking a certain way in this world. He spent time this world, this world, this world. And in reality, uh, you know, he's uh, he going to have a nice surprise to him uh, waiting for him when he arrives to the next world and it's empty uh, or worse. Why? Because you spent all your time on this world. A person needs to understand if you are going to, uh, you know, use your tools to build that next world, you have to build it. You have to build it. Now, to build it requires a lot of emunah. Why? Because you're going against the, the tide. Everybody in the world today, or most people in the world today, they're focusing on this world. They're focusing on being a build a house and a bigger career and a bigger name and a bigger, 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 this world. Very few people are concerned about the next world. And when they see somebody that's concerned about the next world, they uh, ignore them, they mock them, they do all types of things. It's simply, can, you know, the, the person that's righteous cannot coexist with wicked people. It is peacefully. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. There has to be some type of action at some point. And we see that Avraham Avinu had non-stop, non-stop people going against them. One of the uh, big tests that Av Avraham Avinu had was when uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu tells him to leave, to leave Haran. Why leave Haran? Because I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to give you all the good things, uh, to give you offspring, give you uh, uh, all types of panasa and so on. So he leaves his place of comfort because Shem told him, you're going to get all these blessings only to arrive and get what? Bupkis. He arrives at Canaan, modern day Israel, and instead of getting what he heard Hashem say to him, Hashem said there's going to be blessings, going to be sustenance, it's going to be food, it's going to be everything. What does he have? He has drought. He has famine. He has people starving in the streets. 
all the wealth that he brought with them is literally being spent day after day to the point of bankruptcy and then we see that Abraham goes to Egypt we see that Abraham goes to Egypt why are Abraham going to Egypt it says we don't see that Hashem commanded him to go to Mitzrayim and Hashem didn't command him to go to Mitzrayim but rather Abraham went to Mitzrayim how could Abraham leave Canaan the place that Hashem commanded him to go and go to Egypt obviously it was an issue of pikuach nefes it was an issue of life risk it was an issue of life risk Hashem gave you a brain to use it you can't expect Hashem to give you prophecy every day gave you a brain so Avram leaves a place where he thought he's going to get blessed he heard he's going to get blessed but he doesn't ask any questions why am I not being blessed simple there's not now he didn't lose an ounce of emunah Hashem said you're going to get blessed but he didn't say exactly when how who what where he just said this is going to be when you're blessed perhaps it didn't happen yet but either way I need to live I need to live long enough to get this blessing so I can't live if I don't have any food if my whole family is starving so I have to leave where can I go go to a place there's food Egypt had food at the time so Avram takes his entire family to Egypt test number one Hashem says something he tells you he's going to bless you with everything and instead of blessing you're seeing something that's very very confusing that is the exact opposite now that you're trying to make your own way you're doing your own you're fulfilling your obligation of effort of your ishtadlut you go to Egypt and for the first time ever he recognizes how beautiful his wife is first time Avram recognizes he says I see now that you're a beautiful a beautiful woman I meaning I've been married to you for decades but only now I realize how beautiful you are and that these Egyptians they're gonna kill me over you so please do me a favor tell me you're my sister now of course the Egyptians take advantage of this they see how beautiful Sarah is despite being as modest as can possibly be everything is covered the reason why Avram himself never knew how beautiful Sarah is because she was so covered she covered everything so he never saw how beautiful his own wife is the the Chachamim teach that Sarah Imenu was so beautiful that if you were to compare her to the most beautiful woman in the world that most beautiful woman literally will look like a chimpanzee next to Sarah Imenu a chimpanzee that has hair on her face and goes Kuku kaka. that's how that beautiful woman looks next to Sarah Imenu. that's how beautiful Sarah was something that's literally incomprehensible and Avraham did not even realize this until he got to Egypt until he dealt with all this famine and the difficulties and decades and problems and so on and so forth now the Egyptians take her they see how beautiful Sarah is they take her they bring her to Paro of course Akadosh Baruch Hu protects the tzaddikah v'inaga Adonai et paro negaim gedolim Kadosh Baruch Hu afflicted paro it's a big uh, big afflictions specifically it's uh, talking about how Akadosh Baruch Hu gave him afflictions to make him know that it's not just your average difficulty it's not just something that could happen from some virus it is specifically related to the fact that you have this woman as a prisoner you have this woman in your possession that's a married woman that's an a Hebrew woman that's the wife of Avraham he shuts off all all of the members of the men and the uh, the women and the, uh, in the house of Paro the women cannot give birth suffering endlessly they're not uh, their their uh, their uh, member is not able to function and everybody understands there's something tragic over here and of course it has to do with Sarah immediately Paro says to Avram Lama Lama Marta Choti why did you tell me why didn't you tell me that she's uh, your wife you told me that she's your sister I was gonna take her to be my wife he lets Avram go he gives him a bunch of money bunch of uh, 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 blessings come from Akadosh Baruch Hu to Avraham through the Egyptian 
Meaning that Akadosh Baruch Hu, part of him, showing Akadosh Baruch, showing Avraham that he is blessed, that he is blessed in a unique way. This blessed in a unique way is to show him that all of the other nations will get their blessings because of you. All of the other nations will get their blessings because of the Jewish people. That's why they get their blessings. So Paroh, he gave Abraham a lot of money. Which means what? Which means that Paroh had a lot of money. Why would HaKadosh Baruch Hu give a lot of money to an idol worshiper? Why would HaKadosh Baruch Hu give so much money to somebody that is not serving him? Simple. Because one day I'm going to use that money to give it to my son. And make it look natural. Simple. So... In essence, I'll give this idol worshiper money. I'll give this Muslim money. I'll give this one money. I'll give all these different people panasa. Why? So they could be the funnel. They could be the vessel for me to give it to my son. For me to give it to my children. And Avraham leaves with an extraordinary amount of money and gold and so on. And he, on his way back, on his way back to Eretz Yisrael, to Canaan, he stops by all of the different inns that he came through. The same ones that he stopped by on the way there, he goes back to them. Why? Because on the way there, he didn't have money to pay them. All he had was a good name. So they laughed at him, but they said, listen, at least he has a good name. Whatever, we'll let you stay for free. It's not like there's uh, so many other customers uh, coming here during this drought and famine and so on. So they let Avraham go, yeah, and they never thought they're going to get the money back. But what a kiddush Hashem it was when those same hotel owners saw that Avraham Avinu came back with an extraordinary amount of money, but not only not to show this money, but rather to pay back his debt. So this is one of the things that a person can learn from Avraham Avinu. If you owe a person money, do not delay paying them back. If you have employees, Pay them as soon as possible. Don't be one of these people that holds the paychecks and plays with people's lives and delays things. If you owe people money, you have it in the account, pay them. Or say, oh, listen, but I don't have to pay till this or that. If you have it, pay it. Don't play games with people. Of course, if you have terms and he says you don't have to pay for another six months, you don't have to pay it right now. But the point I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of people that simply, they like to borrow money, but they don't like to pay it back. They don't like to pay it back. Such a person, Abu Tayyip Karim, it doesn't understand what kind of tragedy they're bringing onto their life. What kind of tragedy they're bringing on their life. Because one of the main reasons why Kadosh Baruch Hu blesses a person is based on their honesty and integrity in money. How they deal with money. Whether they have emunah when they're dealing with money. That's the, what's the first question that a person is asked when they get up to Shemaim. If you're not an honest person when it comes to money, when it comes to business... Simply, you could take your olam haba, your heaven that's in your imagination, just put it in some, you know, garbage, in some, uh, you know, some uh, sanitation department, because olam haba and you are not going to be friends. They're not going to be friends. Why? You weren't honest in your business dealings today. Why would HaKadosh Baruch Hu let you live forever? For what reason? And that's, that's a very, very important thing. Now, of course, again, at times a person makes mistakes. A person makes mistakes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them the opportunity to do tshuva. You made a mistake, you stole money from somebody, no problem. You can pay it back. Oh, what if I don't have? Pay what you can. Oh, what if I don't have anything? Okay, write it, plan for you to start paying as soon as you have. Don't wait until you become rich or you have everything to pay back. At least show that you're trying. Show that you're trying. Yeah, I owe him $100,000. All I have is $300. Pay the $300. If that's what you have, pay the $300. At the very least, it shows that you're trying. You're trying to be honest. You're trying to serve Hashem even when it comes to your business. And that's one of the things that sometimes people don't take into account. They think that serving Hashem only comes in inside the Bit Knesset, inside the synagogue. They think that serving Hashem is only inside the synagogue and perhaps when a, uh, there's a homeless guy, give him a dollar. But when it comes to their business dealings, when it comes to how they operate their financial situations, they don't uh, think Hashem is involved there. And in reality, it's quite the opposite. Hashem is more involved in those business dealings than he is involved in your uh, your uh, Bet Knesset situation. Why? Because if you go to Bet Knesset, everybody can look at, look at Sadiq. Inside a synagogue, everyone can look at Sadiq. 
But the real tzaddikim, they look like tzaddikim in their business. They look like tzaddikim in how they operate their business. And if they're tzaddikim in their business, surely they're going to be tzaddikim in, their, in the synagogue also. Now sometimes you're going to see people that are generally honest in their business, but they're not keeping Torah and mitzvot. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Why? That person perhaps is honest in, when it comes to certain business dealings and so on, but there is, if he's not serving Hashem also, then his lackings, his deficiency is somewhere else. Because it's not possible to be righteous without serving Hashem. It's not possible. So now, Avraham Avinu shows us that even as business dealings have a Kadosh Baruch Hu in mind, and he is not questioning Hashem. Hashem said he's going to be blessed. He went to the place that's supposed to get the blessing. It didn't happen. No emunah problems. He continued going. Test comes. He passes the test. Passes the test. This brings reward to not only Avraham, but everybody that's around him. And this is one of the things that you see in a person that's blessed. A person that's blessed also ends up giving good to the people around them. All of a sudden, other people are benefiting because of his blessings. Other people are able to now conduct business. Other people are getting uh, blessings. All of a sudden, a woman that hasn't been able to, to, to have a child for five, six, seven, ten years, all of a sudden she's uh, pregnant, ready to have a kid. A guy that's been looking for a shiduch for five, ten years, all of a sudden he's getting married. Another person that wasn't able to even find a job, all of a sudden he's starting to make a lot of money. A, uh, all types of blessings are coming everybody else. Just like the Gemara says in Masechet Ta'anit, the whole world gets their sustenance because of Rabbi Kharina, my son. And Rabbi Kharina is uh, eating cherubs. Why? Because Rabbi Kharina is happy with his share. But his righteousness is so extraordinary that I'm giving the sustenance of the entire world because of Rabbi Kharina. Meaning that the Jews, the non-Jews, the righteous, the wicked, everybody's getting their sustenance because of the righteousness of Rabbi Chayna. When a person starts to get, to get blessings, all of the people involved also do. And that's also one of the beautiful things that I get to see firsthand. I get to see firsthand uh, where I've told you guys this before. There are sometimes people that, you know, from time to time, they'll watch a shiur, they'll get inspired, they'll send you a few dollars to support it. And, you know, they'll come and go. They'll come and go like an acquaintance. They'll come and go like an acquaintance. But there are some people that are not just avid fans and, and students and they take everything at the heart, but they're also partners where they make sure that whatever sustenance Hashem gives them, whether it's a lot or it's a little, they make sure that a part of that goes to Bezat Hashem, goes to supporting the Kiruv that we do, the Torah, the Kolel, the uh, seminary, the, all the things that we're doing, they make sure Bezat Hashem is not just something on their screen, it's not just something on their phone, it's not just something that they share with their friends or say in their, uh, on their Shukhan Shabbat, but also it's something that that's where their money is going. And the beautiful thing that I've been able to, to, to merit seeing over the last, I don't know, seven, eight years that we've been doing this is how every single one of those people, with no exception, their parnasa has drastically changed. Some of them, uh, their salaries, their, uh, their, their businesses have gone up drastically. Others, simply their businesses were protected. Simply their businesses were protected. They were supposed to go bankrupt already five, six years ago. But the fact that they continued donating a part of the money literally protected the business and in some cases even grew it. I have one particular student, literally, he was supposed to go, he tells me himself, he was supposed to go bankrupt five, six years ago. Supposed to go bankrupt five, six years ago. About a year and a half ago, he tells me, listen, Rabbi, I, I don't know what to do. My house, Baruch Hashem, I have blessing in my house. My wife is good. My kids are good. But the problem is the house is little. The house is little and, you know, it's causing shlom bait problems. I need to get a uh, bigger house. But I don't know what to do. I, I need to buy a bigger house. I need more money. I said, ask your boss for a bigger salary. He goes, no, no, they're not going to pay me. I said, no, no, listen, for what you do, ask him for this, this, and this. He said, Rabbi, what, what you're telling me is to ask them for, to, for them to triple, triple my salary. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm scared to ask him for an increase. You're telling me to ask him for triple? I said, yeah, that's how you're going to buy the house. He says, what if they say no? I said, don't worry about it. Said, As you would have it, Baruch Hashem, he had... Emunat Chachamin, he listened to what I said. They said no. 
they said no but a different solution came to the same business and everything else and listen we can't do this but we're willing to give you a loan okay you no problem and we'll give you a little bonus too and we'll give you this and we'll give you that and before you know it the loan the bonus and everything else free gift ended up being even more than what he asked for today he lives in a brand new house why Akadosh Baruch Hu does what he does because this person makes a commitment every single month to make sure that he has his money going to the right place and I've seen this time and time again and then sometimes you see certain people that they're uh, they uh, they want to send you uh you know a few a uh, few remains on their table whatever is like you know whatever is left under the khala they want to throw you that share of, of of whatever their sustenance is and then they they ask you for blessings from here till next year from here to next year and they're surprised they don't get the blessings but the worst of it all is when you have people that you they literally they do whatever they do you're regardless of whether someone donates or they don't donate you try to help them you try to answer their questions you try to fix their their uh shlombite problems if you have a uh to, to help them with a zivug you help them with a zivug whatever you can do you do you don't do it because of money if you're going to try to help people and you're doing it for money it's it's not going to work it's not going to work because it's either money or you help people if you help people because those roles are going to give you the money anyway but if you're doing it for money then don't even bother trying to help people because it's not going to work you're not going to have the siyat nishmaya but anyway sometimes you have people you help them you, you literally uh, middle of the night you do everything and these people they get the blessings they a woman is suddenly pregnant she finds a zivug, uh, he, uh, gets the job. Whatever blessings they were looking for or blessings they were looking for, they get. And what do they do? Listen, Rabbi, um, I know you haven't uh, seen my donations in a long time. And to be honest with you, I don't see anybody's donations because I don't look at this stuff usually. Unless it's something significant that's out of the uh, thing, I don't usually follow it. Whatever it is, at the end of the month, I check the accounts, what to transfer here, what to transfer there, pay the employees, ta ta ta, finished. Uh, it's uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu provides. Baruch Hashem, Akadosh Baruch Hu provides. We don't really uh, check. Sometimes, you know, you see, oh, wait, hold on. This month, oh, we weren't even able to pay the uh, uh, rent with the money that came in. Okay, that's good, but we have money from last month. So last month, Hashem sent me double blessing. Oh, Yishtabach Shimon. Okay, no problem. That's how we pay. Oh, this month, we got this. Oh, Baruch Hashem, this is a lot. This is a little. Best month ever. Worst month ever. And it goes up, down, sideways, but you don't bother following this stuff day to day. Sometimes people say, did you get my donation? I have to check. Why? I probably did get it but i just don't have the time to look at all this stuff because i'm too busy helping people but sometimes the people that you help are the worst people in the world they ask you give and give and give and give and give and say rabbi listen i know you didn't get my donation but it's because i'm giving to somebody else because there's a bigger tax benefit or it's local or uh, you know people are asking me oh this or that wait so all of the help all of the work all of the blessings came from what we're doing here but what you're doing is you're giving what you got somewhere else yeah okay no problem if you need any help let us know in reality it hurts but those people don't even see straight they think oh no as long as i'm doing a mitzvah it's no big deal and then they're surprised that they lose the blessing then they're surprised that they have a divorce every other day then they're surprised that they can't find a single job then they're surprised they have all troubles why because like those who he gave you the blessing because of one thing you didn't do it he takes it back he takes it back that's what happened with lot lot got an enormous amount of money along with avraham avinu says that the gam lot the gam le lot aulech at avraham ayat sonu bakar ve'olim lot got an enormous amount of money but he started going the awful way he decided to leave avraham go to zdom what happens to him in Zdom? First, he gets a job. Looks like he's important. He's the head judge. Looks good. Looks like it's even getting get better. But suddenly, he becomes a prisoner. Loses everything that he has. In one second. In one second. Sometimes people forget who Hashem is. They forget who Hashem is. They don't realize it. Who changes the world just like that. Person one day can have a million dollars in the bank. Next day zero how simply government decides to take it from you no why would they take it from you no reason good reason bad reason whatever reason why do they take it well, you have to do tshuva to figure that out oh but, but, but wow, i was doing good i was keeping this i was keeping that okay so what do you think Hashem makes mistakes 
Either it's because of the tikkun, for something you did in the past, or something that you're doing now, but surely it's not a mistake. Surely it's not a mistake. Akadosh Baruch Hu does not take life from you, which is what money is. Money is a person's life. That's what he spends their life doing. For no reason. If he took money from you, there's a reason. There's a reason. One of the greatest donors at the time of the Bet HaMikdash was Nagdimon Ben Guyon. Nagdimon Ben Guyon was very, very generous, very, very rich, gave an enormous amount of money, millions and millions and millions of dollars. One of the three people that was providing sustenance to all of Am Yisrael over there. One day, the Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan sees Nagdimon Ben Guyon's daughter looking for food inside the waist of the donkeys of the Arabs. How could this be? Your father gave a lot of tzedakah, Rabbi Yochanan says. She said, he gave a lot, but not enough. He gave a lot, but not enough. He gave millions of dollars. But in his level, it wasn't enough. He was supposed to give more. Whether that more means another million, another 500 million, I don't know. What I do know is that had Nagdimon Ben Gulyon known that it's going to cost him another few million dollars to keep everything he has, surely he would have given it. In fact, Rabbi Yochanan had a family relative. Family relative that he saw, this person has a decree on them. Comes to the relative and says, I need you to give me tzedakah. Never asked you for tzedakah before, I need you to give me tzedakah. Okay, here's tzedakah. No, no, I need you to give more. Here's more. All right, give me more. Here's more. Calls him again. I need more. Okay, more. Before you know it, literally took 90% of their money. 90% of their money took. Person followed that Torah. What are you going to do? Followed. Rabbi keeps asking. There's a reason for it. He's not asking for uh, to go build a hotel. He's doing it for a reason. Okay, he gave him literally most of what he had. If the rabbi is making an effort to come ask me, then I'm going to go do it. Suddenly, the government shows up at his door and says, you have a fine from the government. You have, we're going to take all the money. What all the money? I had seven and a half million dollars. All I have left is a hundred thousand dollars left. What happened to all the money? Oh, I gave it away already. Okay, we're going to take that. Okay, take it. He goes to Rabbi Yochanan. He says, Rabbi, I'm angry at you. He says, Why? He says, if obviously you asked for the taka because obviously you saw Bewoch HaKodesh that there was a decree that all my money was begun. And instead of it being going to the government, use it for Staka. Why don't you just take all of it? Why don't you tell me I would have given you all of it in one chance? Instead of wasting $100,000 to the government, I would have at least given you that also for Staka. Rabbi Yochanan says to him, no, 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 no. Had you known why I'm asking you for all this and pushing and pushing and pushing... It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have protected you. It wouldn't have helped you. It had to be difficult. If it's difficult for you to give, it's a good sign. It's a good sign. Avram got a lot of blessing. Lot got a lot of blessing, but Lot lost it. Lot lost it. After Avram goes and fights all of these nations, him and his servant Eliezer, those two alone, the Midrash says, fight all of those nations. Eliezer was... Powerful tzaddik, Avram, powerful tzaddik, but not just powerful muscles. All they needed, they had powerful kedusha. Why? They didn't need anything else. Avram simply went to where all the enemies were, picked up some sand, threw it in the air. All the sand turned into rockets and simply destroyed the enemy. That's it. Finish. Yeah, but that same enemy killed a bunch of giants, killed a bunch of uh, big armies. Yeah, they killed, they killed. Why? Because those people who want to kill those people anyway. So he allowed them to kill, he allowed them to kill whoever they want to kill. But Chaz Shalom, that they're going to go against us. Yeah, but there's only you and uh, Eliezer. So what? There's you and Eliezer. What is that? I need to have uh, a lot of people. Abraham understands he has a unique blessing. He doesn't need a million people. All he needs is Hashem. All he needs is Hashem. Now after he destroys all these people, the one of the people that's freed is the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom says to Avram, why don't you take, take all the money, I'll take the people. Avram says, what is this, what is it, 500 million here? A billion dollars here? You want to give that to me? No thanks. In fact, even a shoestring, a shoestring I'm not going to take from you. Why? I don't want any rasha in the world to say that I only 
became rich because of him. I know I become rich only because of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Sometimes there are certain people you shouldn't do business with them. Why? They're wicked people. You shouldn't do anything with them. There are certain people, Mamash, you have to run away from them. You have to run away from them. Sometimes there are certain people, they contact our organization, they say a whole song and dance, they say they want to donate, they want to do this, they want to do that, and then they're surprised. Nobody contacts them. Wait a minute. Every time I call somebody, they uh, call me 500 times, and then eventually sometimes they donate, sometimes they not, and you guys don't even call back. All you did is send us a link if I want to donate. I want you to meet me. I want you to call me. I want you to this. I want you to that. That's not our way. Our way is, if you want to donate, go to the website. Go to the website, donate. What, do you want me to convince you to donate? That's not how we work. If you're having trouble, the website doesn't work, you don't know how to click donate, or it doesn't work for some type of reason in your country, or whatever, we could send you know somebody to call you to... Uh, uh, to process the donation manually, that's no problem. But you want any one of the rabbis, people that dedicate their, their, their lives to Torah, to go call you and start schmoozing you to convince you to donate, that's not our policy. Not our policy. It's not what we do. Why? We want people that want. We want, want people that want to publicize Torah. We want people that want to publicize the Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. That's what we want. You, don't, you want to publicize yourself? There are plenty of organizations that will help you do that. And this, some people don't like that. Don't like it. Don't like it. But Baruch Hashem, there's enough people that do. There's enough people that do, and they continue to be more and more. And that's, that's, that's the, one of the things that's been one of our secret ingredients that drives people crazy. Why? Because we're not looking to build any individual's name. We're looking to build Hashem's name. Make it greater and greater and greater, and the store greater and greater and greater. That's what we want. Avraham was so careful in his business dealings, he says, I don't even want to deal with the Rasha. I don't even want to deal with the Rasha, so the Rasha can never even think. Can never even think, even, and never even have a reason to go tell his wicked friends that the reason why Avraham is so successful is because I gave him that money. I don't even want that to be a joke. And Hidavka rejected all of his money, showing how much emuna Avraham has. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu tells him, Al tira Avraham, Anochim again lecha, Scharecha, Arbe meod. Don't worry, Avraham, I'm a shield for you. Your reward is very great. In so many words, the Kadosh Baruch Hu shows Avraham, I'm with you. I'm with you. This Rabotai is one of the things that you see, but one of the things that a person needs to, needs to, uh, uh, also take, a, take into uh, account is that in the uh, 15th chapter, verse number 6, it says, And he trusted in Hashem and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So who are we talking about? Avraham asks Hashem, what are you going to give me? What's my reward? Hashem says what he's going to give him. And Avraham trusts in Hashem. And he, meaning Hashem, saw, reckoned it as righteousness. Avraham is perfectly fit, is the perfect vessel for me to bring all of the sustenance, all of the blessings for eternity to Am Yisrael through. He is the vessel. Why? He believes in me. He doesn't ask to see it. Oh, let me see it. Can you show me a proof? Can you show me now? Can I see it now? Can I go now? No. Avraham simply has simple emunah. Simple emunah in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What? This is what you said? Okay, that's what I do. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, but if Hashem talked to me, I would also believe in Him. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. If you don't believe in Him, Without him talking to you, surely you don't believe in him if he's going to talk to you. Why? Because what do you think the Torah is for? Torah is not for Abraham Avinu. The five books of Moses is not for Abraham Avinu. Even though Abraham Avinu knows the entire Torah, and he's written in the Torah, the five books of Moses is not for Abraham It's for you. It's instructions for you. Akadosh Baruch is talking to you in the Torah. This is the love letter of Akadosh Baruch to you, to me, to everybody in the world. And if you're not willing to listen to the word of Akadosh Baruch through the Torah, both the written Torah and the oral Torah, both through the word of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his sages, 
You wouldn't even listen to him even if he himself talked to you. Even if he said Moshe Rabbeinu to talk to you, you wouldn't listen to him. Why? It's all excuses. It's all excuses. Avram, no excuses. Kadosh Baruch Hu, what you said, that's what I do. Simple emunah. And for that, Kadosh Baruch Hu made Avram a major vessel. Years ago, in uh, Italy, there was a keilah of Jews. It was a keilah of Jews. And there was a uh, righteous person named Reb Nachum. Reb Nachum was very successful. And uh, his servant that he had in his, uh, in his house was a young Jewish boy named Yitzchak. This little Yitzchak came from a poor Jewish family. And uh, he had to make his, uh, make his way in the world. He was a little kid. There was no food in the house. So he became a uh, helper in Reb Nachum's house. Now he didn't have time and ability to learn Torah, but anything that he could hear, Reb Nachum, listen, you know, teach, or somebody else in the house, all the visitors that are coming, all the rabbis that were coming from Eretz Yisrael to collect staka for the yeshivot, for Tamidei Chachamim, they would always come to Reb Nachum, and Yitzchak would listen to whatever he can, learn whatever he can. He loved the Torah, but he couldn't go into a yeshiva and learn all day like he wanted to. But he could whatever he could. Now surely, the, uh, Reb Nachum, because he was successful, and he was very generous and a very gracious host, anytime somebody came from Eretz Yisrael to collect staka, they would stay by Reb Nachum's house. And one of the times that a very big Rav from Eretz Yisrael came to Italy to collect some staka, they stayed by Reb Nachum, and they were very successful in collecting staka. And the, uh, this tzaddik was sitting with Reb Nachum, and Reb Nachum asked Yitzhak to come join them. He says, Yitzhak, you know this Rav is very big Talmud Chacham, he's a tzaddik, he's this, he's that. You know, he was very successful in all the tzedakah that he raised for his yeshiva. Some people gave him a hundred gold coins. Some people gave him 200 gold coins. Some people gave him 300 gold coins, Yitzhak. And I gave him a thousand gold coins, Yitzhak. Hashem was with him in this mission. Because Hashem knows that he's, everything that he's doing is for the sake of the Torah. Now, Yitzhak, what will you give? Surely you want a piece of the Torah. Little Yitzhak got so excited that he's being included runs to his room, goes to his drawer, whatever he can find, all the things, ah, ah, oh, here's the money, all the money that he collected over months and months of working. Got all the money together, put it all together, and he says, ah, I have all the money together, all the money collected over a long period of time, all of it together, I have one gold coin. He comes excited. He comes to Reb Nachum, here, here, please, here, Kodarav, here, take, take, this is for the Torah. This is all I have in the world. This. The big Rav got very, very excited. Very emotional. Reb Nachum got very emotional. Give. Penny, two pennies, a dollar, whatever it is, small amount of money is one thing. All the money you have, no one asked you to do that. You did it on your own. Something special here. The Rav gave little Yitzchak a blessing. He says, May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless you with the blessings of the Torah and you become extremely successful. And that the next time that I come here, you will have the ability to give like Rab Nachum gave. Yitzchak was so excited. That he got this blessing, Baruch Hashem. Short while later, days, days passed, not months or years. Yitzchak was went to the market to go buy certain things for his master, for Rab Nachum. He saw that in the market there's a lot of commotion. Why was there a commotion? Every so often. A ship would come with a lot of goods and they would take all of the different barrels full of goods sealed they'd put it out there and there would become an auction who wants to buy what who wants to do this but this community had a unusual policy what was the policy if your hand was on the barrel that means you wanted to buy it 
And these sailors would get these things from different places. No one would, uh, was able to verify who, what, when, how. Simply a business gamble. So little Yitzchak was trying to go through the commotion to see what's going on. What's all the yelling, the screaming. People are pushing him, this, that. Eventually he catches himself. Catches himself from falling by catching on one of the uh, barrels. Soon as he is over there, everybody knows who he is. He is Reb Nachum, the wealthy Jew's uh, servant. You see, oh, he might be he's here to buy these barrels. So one guy says hundred. Another guy says two hundred. Another guy says three hundred, four hundred. They stop bidding, but they see that this little Itzchak is not moving. He doesn't realize what's happening here. And they're realizing, ah, his master sent him here and told him, pay any price for these barrels. Yalla, stop. Don't even bother bidding against him. He's going to outbid all of us. Let it go. After the bid got pretty high, say, sold. Everybody's, wow, who, what, where? They put the three barrels on a uh, carriage and they come and they go towards Reb Nachum's house. Now Yitzhak didn't know what actually happened. He left, went back to his master's house. Short while later, the barrels show up. They knock on the door. Nachum opens and he sees these people. He says, what's this? He says, uh, Reb Nachum, this is your uh, this is your merchandise. He says, my merchandise. Goes, sure, that's uh, you bought it today, and we're here to collect the payment. How much is the payment? Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, a thousand gold coins, huge amount of money. But I didn't buy this. He goes, no, 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 you bought it. Your uh, servant. Immediately, Reb Nachum was a chacham. He realized what happened. Something is a mistake. He didn't do this on purpose. He's a good kid. No problem, here's your money. He didn't even get angry. He called his young servant Yitzchak, said, Yitzchak, I want to show you something. As soon as Yitzchak showed up, he sees this, he goes, what's this? So these are the barrels you bought. He goes, I, I didn't buy anything. He goes, no, no, that's the ones you bought. No, I didn't do it. Oh, no. Yeah, when you put your hand on, did you put your hand on the barrel? Yeah, I almost fell, so I, just, I was leaning on the barrels. He goes, yeah, well, <laughs> that's... You almost fell, it's good. It's good you didn't fall, but you also bought a thousand gold coins. A hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, stuff. That's what you bought. It's like started crying, the poor kid. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Nachum said, no, no, don't worry. Don't worry for a second. I'm not showing you this to make you feel bad. I'm showing this to show you how Hashem works. This surely is Hashem. Hashem sent this. Hashem bought this. Not you. Don't worry. <laughs> Little Yitzchak walks away happy that his master is not upset with him but upset with himself that he's so clueless of how the world works. But Reb Nachum, he has got $100,000 worth of stuff here. Three barrels full of stuff here. What's in them? Decides I'm going to go open them. He opens the first barrel amazed. Dazzled. Shocked is an understatement. Light comes out from the barrel because the whole barrel is full of gold coins. The whole barrel is full of gold. He opens the other two barrels. They're also full of gold. Much, much more than a thousand coins, a thousand gold coins. But Reb Nachum was a tzaddik. Reb Nachum had yirat shamayim. And he knew at that moment that this money does not belong to him. Yeah, but he bought it. Yeah, he bought it. That's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu used him as a servant. For who? For Yitzchak. Because Yitzchak gave all of his money for the sake of Torah. You gave a thousand, that's good. But Yitzchak gave everything. Surely the rabbi's blessing of this came true for him, not for you. He calls Yitzchak, he says, this is what Hashem sent you. Yitzchak says, me? But, but, but it's you, it's me. It 
It's yours. Akadosh Baruch Hu, your father in heaven, he sent you this. You're a very rich young man now. Yitzchak became very, very wealthy in an instant. Just like Abraham Avinu, in an instant. And what did he do with that money? He spent an enormous amount of money giving tzedakah for the sake of the Torah. Didn't need to work anymore, so he spent all of his time learning Torah. A year later, that rabbi, that tzaddik, came back to Italy. And little Yitzchak gave him an enormous amount of money for the sake of the Avrichim. Why? He knew that's where the money needs to go. The reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu sent me the money in the first place was to test me to see if I give it for the Torah. Yeah, but you had so little. Little, a lot. I gave it. Why? Because I didn't need it at the time, but the Torah needed it at the time. Yeah, but he already had thousands of coins. So I want to have a share. It's not about the quantity. It's about the effort. And because I did what I did, HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewarded me. Why? Schar mitzvah, mitzvah. Mishnah Nebot says the reward for a mitzvah is another mitzvah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw how much I liked the mitzvah of giving tzedakah for the sake of Torah. So what did he do? He sent me more money. How much more money? A lot more. So I can make the same mitzvah a lot more times. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did. And this Yitzchak gave him a lot of money for tzedakah. He continued becoming richer and richer because everything that he touched became blessed like Avraham Avinu. But he also did not forget that he has an obligation in the world to learn Torah day and night and that's what he did and eventually became an extraordinary Talmud Chacham and wrote an important sefer called Sdei Yitzchak. Sdei Yitzchak is an important sefer he built the yeshiva in Tveria, supporting Talmidei Chachamim and Rabutai Karim. His Torah is here for eternity. Why? The Mesirut Nefesh. But the Mesirut Nefesh came with simple emuna, emuna that Hakadosh Baruch Hu is testing us in everything, especially when it comes to the issues of money. Bezat Hashem, this will give us the chizuk that we need to deal with all the different tests that Hakadosh Baruch Hu sends us. So we can get the rewards both in this world and the next of building the Torah, of building Am Yisrael to be stronger, to be more blessed, and Be'ezot Hashem to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. With that being said, I'm going to have a little bit of a drink and you guys could ask some questions. Where's my cup? Let's see. I got a cup somewhere. I already did a blessing before. Okay, let's go to the questions. Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, Yona. How can I judge others more favorably? Should you g always give people the benefit of the doubt? Very good question. There's an obligation to give the benefit of the doubt, but only to specific types of people. Which type of people? If the person is considered part of your nation, meaning that if he is a Torah observant Jew, then you have, you have an obligation to give him the benefit of the doubt. Where even if you see him doing something that looks like he's doing something wrong, you have to use your imagination to see why what he's doing is not wrong. You see him driving on Shabbat, but you know that this person keeps Shabbat. So you have to imagine that somebody in his car, that he's taken to the hospital. So it's a life risk. He's doing a mitzvah now. You see this person is a, uh, doing, something, uh, doing something that uh, doesn't look uh, good, but he's known as a kosher person. You're obligated to give him the benefit of the doubt. But if a person is not Torah observant, you have no obligation to give him the benefit of the doubt. And if he's a wicked person, meaning he's known as a wicked person, then you're forbidden from giving him kafzchut. Forbidden from giving him a, a benefit of the doubt. Uh, so if you can't, if Hitler comes into the market and starts giving out food, you're not allowed to give him benefit of the doubt that he did chuba. In fact, you have to say, listen, everybody don't eat from him. He has poison. He has poison in his sandwiches. Why? He's known as a killer. He's known as a killer. So the whole judging people favorably thing 
has been a, uh, as uh, Rav Avigdo Miller says, has been uh, misconstrued and uh, misrepresented by the, uh, the wicked, idolatrous religion of Christianity that uh, says that it's the religion of love while they murder millions of people throughout the generations and don't even practice the, the love that they talk about themselves. Uh, but they say, listen, look, it's Joske says if he hits you on one cheek, give him the other cheek. That's all nonsense. Judging everybody favorably is complete stupidity. Cannot judge everybody favorably. You have to judge people favorably that earned, earned the uh, thing. Now, of course, you can't know everybody. So that means if that person looks religious, he's known as a religious person, you have to judge them favorably. But if you, uh, you know this person not to be a religious person, you don't have an obligation to judge him favorably. If you know he's a wicked person, you're not allowed to judge him favorably. Next, Israel is asking, I have a recurring dream about mountains growing out of nowhere in my location, which is a flat terrain. Does this mean something dangerous? Uh, also, prior uh, to have the, uh, the pest, which Baruch Hashem uh, saved for me, I dreamt about broken teeth. Oh, okay, Baruch Hashem. Uh, as far as uh, mountains uh, growing, uh, it's, I mean, if it's a recurring dream, uh, potentially could mean that you're going to move. Potentially could mean that you're going to grow in uh, in uh, in your servitude of Hashem and your Torah and your uh, mitzvot and different things. Uh, and I know you, uh, you know, from that you're not a person that wastes their time watching television or all types of filth. So surely, it's if Hashem is showing you something uh, growth, it uh, it looks like a positive sign. Specifically, what it, how Hashem wants to make this growth in your life remains to be seen, but it looks like a positive thing. Looks like a positive thing, Bezal Hashem. Uh, Charlie's asking, I know you can't commit any of the three cardinal sins to save your own life, but what about saving another person's life? Uh, no, you're not allowed to uh, commit any of the cardinal sins to save your life or anybody else's life. Not allowed to commit idolatry, not allowed to uh, commit uh, immorality, meaning a man cannot uh, be with a woman uh, that's not his wife or uh, with a uh, non-Jew or rape somebody. He's not allowed to do any of these things for the sake of saving somebody's life. He's not allowed to uh, uh, commit idolatry and he's not allowed to murder anybody. Those are the three cardinal sins and you're not allowed to do those things for the sake of saving your life or anybody else's life if that's the only option is either dying or making those sins. A, a Jew has to die. A Jew has to die. There's a machloket of whether a non-Jew has to die uh, for the sake of not committing idolatry. And uh, some sages say they do, and some sages say they don't. But nonetheless, a Jew is uh, forbidden from making any of those uh, uh, cardinal sins of idolatry, of immorality, or of uh, um, uh, murder uh, in order to save their life or anybody else's. Jack is saying... Uh, uh, on a boat with a life. If you're on a boat, if you're okay, I'm trying to. Understand. If you're on a boat with one life jacket to spare, and if you can save one person, one was Asher Meza and the other person was Manus Friedman. Which one would you save and why? Uh, it's an interesting question. Interesting question. Uh, Leia. Uh, is it allowed to hang pi uh, pictures of tzaddikim in a child's bedroom? Uh, it's not only allowed, it's recommended. Uh, what do you want the kid to look at? Uh, 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 animals? The worst thing that a person could hang in a child's bedroom is uh, scary animals. When a, a lot of parents do make this mistake of, uh, of, of hanging lions and dinosaurs and all types of scary animals uh, that uh, the parent thinks it's cool and even the kid likes when, uh, you know, during the day. But uh, those pictures create uh, a lot of nightmares for the kids. Uh, if you want to hang pictures of, uh, you know, in a, the kid's room, it should either be of uh, some type of, uh, you know, forest, things, uh, things that are, you know, pretty or, or uh, for sure, tzaddikim. Absolutely a great idea to put pictures of tzaddikim in your kid's room because if your kid looks at tzaddikim, there's not the shame, he'll admire those tzaddikim. If he admires those tzaddikim, he'll want to be a tzaddik. How do I know this? We learn from Rav Steinemann, Allah wa shalom, says that Rav Steinemann was asked the question that if you're allowed 
to send a child to a preschool, to a preschool that uh, is run by a secular person, secular Israeli. Now, surely you're not allowed to send a uh, kid that's first, second, third grade, already a child that's the age of chinuch, uh, after six years old, to a secular school, a public school. There's no permission whatsoever. But what about a kid that's below that, that's younger than that, that's only, you know, three years old, four years old? Can you send him to a secular uh, school? So they ask Rav Steinem in this, the Gdol Ado. Rav Gdol Ado says, if the teacher is willing to replace the pictures that they have on the walls of all those Zionists, of Herzeli Machshimo and Ben Gurion and all that other, all of those people that they have, and they want to, they're willing to replace that with Sadiqim, if they're willing to put Sadiqim on the walls, then you could, you could send your kid to that uh, preschool. But if they're not willing to put Sadiqim on the walls and they're only going to have Reshaim on the walls, not allowed to send your kid to that school. Not to, not. What about if there's boys and girls and they're three years old? No big deal. They can go. As long as there's Tzadikim on the walls. Why? If the kid looks up and sees Tzadikim, Bezot Hashem, he'll admire Tzadikim and he'll want to be a Tzadik. If she sees Tzadikim, she'll admire Tzadikim and she'll want to be married to a Tzadik. To bring Tzadikim to the world, Bezot Hashem. So it's very, very good for a uh, young kid to see the picture of our Tzadikim. Uh, simply because it gives them something to uh, aspire to be, uh, aspire to, to be part of, uh, and most importantly, to be proud of something, be, part of, uh, be proud of this nation that has more, more great people than all of the other nations combined. And that's one of the things that a lot of people don't take into account. Despite how small our nation is, our nation has had more great people more extraordinary people that contributed not just to the Jewish people, but contributed to all of society, contributed to the world, than all of the other countries, all of the other civilizations combined. Simply just count our Chachamim versus their Chachamim. Count, do a simple count. Can't just count the Nobel Prize winners, even though we already have 200, which is 20% of all the Nobel Prizes went to, to, uh, to Israel. That's literally less than a tenth of a percent of the, of the population in the world today. Uh, but nonetheless, if you simply count all of the Chachamim that America ever had, all the Chachamim that Germany ever had, all the Chachamim that, I don't know, any of the other nations had, you compare them to the Chachamim that Am Yisrael has, simply, it's like, uh, it's like literally uh, comp- comparing a planet to a uh, little neighborhood. No, there's nothing you compare. There's more Chachamim, there's more sages, amazing people that Am Yisrael has had than all of the other nations combined. And for a kid to see that this is your ancestors, this is your grandfather, this is your grandfather, this is your grandmother, this is all these tzaddikim, you're related to these people, you're connected to these people, that, there's nothing better than that in the world. But people that think, oh no, I don't want to have the pictures of tzaddikim, maybe it's idolatry, that's garbage in your head. You still haven't submitted to the words of the sages. That's why you think it's idolatry. You're not idolizing the sages. We are celebrating the sages. We want to be the dust under their feet because we want to learn their Torah because they sacrificed their entire life for the sake of the Torah. What did you sacrifice? So the reality is a person understands who the sages are, how great they are. They want to learn their Torah. They want to follow their footsteps. Why? Because they were great people. They were extraordinary people that literally contributed to society in, in, in a fashion that is irreplaceable, irreplaceable. And uh, just to give you guys a little bit of uh, humor, even though it's the middle of the lecture, I don't usually give jokes in the middle of the lectures, but I also don't usually give jokes, period. So I'll give you guys a joke what has to do with the subject. One of our cousins that we meet, this, uh, this uh, parasha is Ishmael. Ishmael, even though he was a rasha during his life, he eventually did tshuva. But his descendants got the blessing that's mentioned in Parashat Lech Lecha of being uh, a huge nation, uh, a nation that uh, has uh, a lot of control, a lot of power, uh, but also will be a, uh, against everyone, and everyone will be against them, and they'll be like pere adam, like animals. And you see that, in essence, they, uh, the, the, the Muslim people are very, very uh, 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 vicious people. Uh, but nonetheless, the blessing did come true that uh, there are a huge amount of people, a billion and a half people in the world or more, two billion people are, uh, are Muslims and, uh, and uh, there, unfortunately, many of them want to kill Jews. 
Many of them want to kill Jews. Some openly, some discreetly, some behind the scenes, some in the open scenes. There's, it's no secret. Now, of course, one of the things that the Muslims uh, like to uh, uh, say is that the, the Jews changed the Torah. Jews changed the Torah. Really, the blessing came to, uh, uh, came to Ishmael, not to Yitzhak, and all types of mumbo-jumbo. And they always like to say of how they're a greater nation, they're bigger, they're better, and it's all types of foolishness. So for, uh, you know, for, for humor, there was uh, once a uh, Muslim that uh, came to uh, one of the Chachamim and said, look, we have many, many more Chachamim, we're a greater nation than you, you guys are little nothings. And I'm willing to bet anything for it. So the uh, Chacham said to them, okay, no problem. No problem, I don't have money, so what I'll do is I'll bet you something else. For every Chacham that you mentioned that came from your people, I'll let you do what you like to do best. I'll let you inflict some pain. I'll let you take one of the hairs from my beard out, pluck it out. For every Chacham that you can name. And for every Chacham that I can name as a Jew, I take one of the hairs out of your beard. Of course, the ox, uh, of course, wants to do this. Hurting a Jew, that's their uh, pleasure. Oh, I have a uh, Ham uh, Muhammad. Okay, tuck. Okay. Oh, I have a uh, Ahmadijad. Okay, tuck. I have a uh, Mustafa. Tuck. I have a uh, da da da. Okay. Okay, after, I don't know, 10, 15, he found somebody. Okay. Oh, you finished? Oh, yeah. What, well, you have more? He said, I have Rabbi Akiva. Tuck. And then he takes both of his hands and 24,000 students. Tuck. That's a Chacham. That's a Chacham Yehudi. The whole beard came out. Why? We have more Chachamim than everybody else. A little kid that sees that they're part of such a great nation should, would never look anywhere else being greener because it's not possible to be better. But th that's the problem today is that a lot of Jews are not proud Jews because they're not aware of how great, how great our lineage is, how great our Torah is, how great the gift is. And, uh, and uh, that's uh, one of the uh, things that is a result of the ignorance in the world. Baruch Hashem, many more are finding out today. Many Jews and many non-Jews are discovering the truth of the Torah and they're becoming uh, closer and closer to Hashem. Some are uh, converting to Judaism from different nations. I just saw the other day a uh, Shi'u Torah by a Korean Jew. A Jew that was a uh, originally a non-Jewish Korean and saw the Torah, fell in love with the Torah, and today he's 100% Shomer Torah and Mitzvot, Jewish person that is capable of teaching Torah in Korean. I mean, that's a, uh, amazing. And I've seen other people from Egypt, from uh, Iran, from uh, uh, England, from Australia, from all different places around the world, all types of people, Chinese, Indonesian, uh, Philippines, Americans, uh, Germans. I even have a couple of people that I know that used to be Nazis have become Jewish people or are in the process of becoming Jewish people. People that used to be gangsters. People that used to be uh, horrible people. Literally have done tshuva, changed their life, and are becoming Jewish people. And Baruch Hashem, it's amazing. It's amazing that people that discover who the Jewish people really are and what their Torah is, it's the, uh, the, the verse in Deuteronomy that says that, uh, you know, that the, the nations will look at Am Yisrael and say, what a smart nation this is, what a great nation this is, based on their Torah. When uh, people discover that uh, the Jewish people uh, are uh, who they really are, they're not looking at uh, the, uh, the, the filth of the world that pretends to be Jewish, like some of these Zionists or these atheists or these... Uh, uh, Marxists, uh, these lefty liberal people that pretend to be Jewish, when in reality the only thing that's Jewish in them is uh, the fact that they uh, uh, say that they know how to spell Jewish. They don't keep anything. They don't, you know, they don't have any connection to anything. So Judaism is based on how a person observes Torah. If a person is willing to observe the entire Torah, they are becoming a Jewish person. If they weren't born Jewish, or they are, they're, they're an observant Jew if they were born Jewish. But when a person knows that uh, who the tzaddikim were and their, their life stories and uh, uh, all the sacrifices, surely that person would want to be that. That's why I recommend for people to 
teach their children as many stories about tzaddikim as possible. As many stories as possible about tzaddikim. Uh, there are many, many books for children that are the, the books specifically meant for kids that are stories of different uh, tzaddikim. Uh, recently, we got a little story from uh, Art Scroll about Rashi. Uh, really beautiful work with some uh, amazing drawings on it. My kids loved it. Even though they already knew the Rashi story, this is their favorite version. Uh, then you have a uh, different uh, series of books that people write about uh, uh, Tzipuret Tzadikim. There's one fantastic series of books. It's highly, highly recommended. It's been in the market for almost 50 years, at least 40 years, probably 50 years. And uh, it's uh, called Tzipuret Tzadikim. It's actually in English. It's called Stories of the Tzadikim. It's a Chabadnik that wrote these stories. But these are stories from the Gemara, from, uh, from uh, 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 Hasidut, from uh, different Tzadikim that he mentioned. It's a uh, whole series of 120 books, uh, little notebooks, amazing true stories. Uh, some of them I've used uh, in, in lectures, including today. And uh, these are amazing, amazing books that they put together. And uh, it was literally, this is how uh, many of the Talmidei Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, that's what they grew up on. Why? Because it was a little blue truck. Little blue truck would go. Uh, from uh, neighborhood to neighborhood, selling a box of books. And they would sell one box of books because usually the people were very poor. One box of books was for the whole neighborhood. Everybody would just lend and borrow different books, and that's what it was. Now, Baruch Hashem, they uh, translated these books to English some years ago. And uh, uh, so it was very nice to find out uh, that uh, they had an available. So Rabbi Ephraim, who himself grew up on these books many years ago, uh, when he found out that they have these both in Hebrew and English, he sent both versions to me. And uh, my kids love these things. I love these things. My wife loves these things, and I highly recommend them. Now, in uh, in, he- in English, uh, it's uh, and in Hebrew, uh, you can buy it on uh, in America, but it's a little difficult. Why? Because there's I've only found one company that sells it. Uh, one company that sells it. Maybe others also have it. It's called in English. Stories of Tzadikim. Stories of Tzadikim. I highly recommend this uh, series, uh, but I would recommend buying the whole series. I mean, you can, I think they also sell them as individuals, like, I don't know, $2 each or something, but I recommend buying the whole thing. Now, the books themselves, the English version, they're not impressive looking, meaning they look like little notebooks with some pictures. They're not impressive looking, but you're not buying it because of how impressive it is, first and foremost. And second of all, it doesn't really make a difference. Kids love them. Kids love them, and that's really what's important. Uh, I think this is a great series. There's also other ones from different publishers, and really one of the greatest gifts that you can give your kids, more than toys, more than bicycles, more than a new tree house, more than anything else, is books. When you make their presence books, when you make their activities books, and you're constantly teaching them, they're constantly learning uh, the weekly parasha books that are out there, they're learning about tzaddikim. They're constantly learning about this stuff. Guess what? They're going to love being Jewish. They're going to be proud of being Jewish. They're going to want to learn more. They're going to be more excited about a new book, a new story, than they're going to be about a bicycle. Now, you still have to do the bicycle stuff once in a while. And you still have to do the running around on a plane because, after all, they're still kids. But if you want your kids to love the Torah, you have to show them the Torah. Not just... Mention it here and there. Show them the Torah. Have pictures of tzaddikim on the walls. Have stories. Have a whole full of library, full of books, and read all of them. Time and time again. Kids can never get enough. They can read the same story 500 times. And they love it just as much each time. You may be uh, bored of it already after so many times, but they love it. Do it. And that's how you get your kids to love the Torah, to love the mitzvot, especially if they're very, very young. Uh, let's see. Oh, the, the publisher's name, publisher's name is, uh, let's see, Machanaim. Machanaim is, um, M-A-C-H-A-N-A-Y-I-M. Machanaim. Uh, the founder is Tamit Chacham, he's a Chabadnik, uh, is, uh, uh, in Eretz Israel. His kids, I believe, took over the business now. 
And uh, it's a good book. I recommend it to a few students. And uh, Baruch Hashem, good results. Highly recommended. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I know you asked a question about the life jacket of who I would spare by one life jacket. I didn't answer the question. That in itself is an answer. Uh, do you do shuckling or stay still during... <laughs> do I shuckle or do I stay still during Amida? Uh, depends. Different times, different this. Uh, depends. Sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes no. I move a lot uh, for different reasons, but uh, you know, during my prayer, sometimes I move more, sometimes I move less. There's no right way or wrong way. The some tzaddikim that were, uh, I believe, like Rav Moshe Feinstein, that were uh, like uh, simply like a uh, stone, wouldn't move, uh, based on how he uh, learned of uh, fear that he had from a. Uh, Russian uh, gulag that wanted to kill him and he was frozen when he uh, when he came to uh, and threatening him and he said at the very minimum I have to be afraid of Hashem as much as I'm afraid of this Russian so from that point on he never moved during his prayers but there are some very big tzaddikim that uh, move more now again a person should act natural meaning don't force yourself to move don't force yourself to move. Like, there are some people that are just really ridiculous. Like, they're putting on so much of a show, they forget to pray. You know, you see the guys like this. Ah! It's like, who are you talking to? Like, what, what is this whole show for? No, you know, you want to move a little bit, no problem. But the whole show of people going like this and this, and, you know, there's no need for that. No need for that. I think, I think, it's a, I think it looks ludicrous. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it's, it's, unless you're really, really a big tzaddik, it's fake. And uh, it's not really what Hashem is looking for. I mean, the also Chachamim say you're not even allowed to move anyway. But, so the point is, whatever it is that you're doing, it should be natural. It should be natural to you. Like, I don't think about moving when I move. Like, sometimes you'll see I'm still when I'm giving a shiu, and sometimes you'll see I'm start moving. I'm not thinking that I'm moving. I only realize that I'm moving after the fact. Sometimes it's uh, after I see the, 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 the lecture online or, uh, or uh, it's, it's been a while and I notice that I'm moving. It's, it's not something you think about. If you're thinking about it, it's not natural. If it's not natural, there's no need to do it. It's the neshama is the, what's supposed to motivate you to move, not uh, the, the, uh, you know, your uh, mentality of what you're supposed to look like. If your neshama is, uh, is causing your body to move, then there's no problem with moving. But if, you're, if your mind is causing you to move where you're thinking about how you look and what to do, it's not natural, it's not recommended, and most of the time it's not even good to do it. Uh, Robert is asking, if one of Rabbi Vajra is writing, in one of Rabbi Vajra's writing, I saw that the nations don't have tshuva. That by repenting, the nations simply withhold punishment. I simply don't understand because of the story of Jonah. Uh, but once and uh, once and for all does once and for all, all does the non-Jew have tshuva okay uh, I've spoken about this before and uh, I got some hate mail because of it uh, they didn't you know people uh, didn't like it especially the uh, non-Jews uh, but it's a myth uh, there's a very significant difference between Jewish people and non-Jewish people uh, as much as people don't want to talk about this elephant in the room, it's a simply a reality. If you believe in Judaism, you believe in a Torah, there is a significant difference between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, one of the places you see it is in this week's parasha. Kadosh Baruch Hu says that uh, Avraham, his descendants, are going to be blessed. So much so that anyone that blesses them, anyone that helps them, will also benefit from that blessing. And anyone that goes against them, anyone that curses them, will be cursed as a result of it. So it's, it's a very unique nation. It's not a uh, because I'm a Jew that I'm telling you this. It's simply a reality. And we've seen it. There's, it's factual proofs of it and so on. Now, Torah tells us that one of the main things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu treats, uh, one of the ways that he treats Am Israel favorably 
is the fact that he gives them the ability to do tshuva. The ability to do tshuva means that a person can be a horrible person, make all type of crimes against the Shem, but if he changes his ways or her ways during their lifetime, they can turn all of the sins that they've made into that were purposeful into accidental and even get to a point of turning some or all of them into mitzvot uh, and eliminate any necessity of punishment eliminate any necessity of genom eliminate all of that but that comes at a very big price it's not an easy thing it's not as easy as it sounds but nonetheless that's available to the jews the non-jews on the other hand do not have this gift of tshuva meaning if they commit a crime they have to suffer for that crime. There is no uh, uh, way to eliminate suffering. Now, what you're talking about as far as Jonah, it's a, and the story of Jonah and the people of Nineveh, where they did tshuva, that their, their tshuva is, did exactly what Rabbi Vadya said. It withheld punishment. Those people were supposed to die because they made certain sins. But because they changed their ways, Hashem did not kill them and allow them to live longer in order to make more good deeds in order for them to earn heaven. But uh, surely they're going to get punished for those sins that they've made. Just not at that moment. It'll be later on. So they'll have to suffer in Ganem or some other uh, place for a certain amount of time before they get their reward. There's no way for them to eliminate those sins. They could change their way and earn themselves eternity of good, but they'll still have a price to pay. They don't have that ability that a Jew has of eliminating all the bad altogether. Simply not possible. So it's a, it's, it's, I know it's hard to hear for some people. It's favoritism. It's not fair. Hashem created all of us. We're all his kids. We're all this. We're all that. Okay. You know, you could believe what you want to believe, not you particularly, but anybody, but that's the truth. That's the truth. Anybody that believes in the Torah, what I just said, that is the dot of the Torah. Jews are different. They're not like non-Jews. It doesn't mean that non-Jews are bad. It doesn't mean that non-Jews are evil. There are many, many good non-Jews that are even mentioned in the Torah. The, uh, the prophet Job was a very, very righteous uh, non-Jew. Uh, the, uh, the, the people that uh, learned the, the book of Job uh, easily do tshuva. Uh, and he was an extremely righteous person, so much so that even Moshe Rabbeinu admired him. Where when he sent the Meraglim, when he sent the spies to Eretz Yisrael, he said, check if there is a tree there and learn from it. What tree? Why are we going to learn from a tree? Tree means a tzaddik. The tzaddik was Job, Rashi says. Moshe Rabbeinu admired Job. He says, because if Job is alive, you can learn from him. And the whole land will have merit as a result of, uh, of Job. So there are some righteous people that are non-Jews. Uh, of course, they have to be observant of the uh, seven Noahide laws and so on. But the, because they have less of a responsibility in the world, less mitzvot, uh, and they're also not the chosen, Hashem does not treat them the same way. Doesn't treat them the same way. Doesn't, they don't have the same account. Even if they're good people, even if they're nice people, they simply do not have the same account. And that's why I tell people, if you can and you want to convert to Judaism, you should do it. If you can't or you don't want to, don't do it. But to say that everybody is the same is not a biblical belief. It's not a Jewish belief. And it's not even a logical belief. You know yourself that not everybody is the same. Only liberal lefties, psychopaths believe that everybody is the same. Uh, everybody knows not everybody the same. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are better than others. Some people, you know, just it's just a reality. You work for a company. Some people make barely minimum wage, uh, and some people make millions of dollars. Why? He is better at the job. What do you mean? But what if you give the other guy the opportunity? You can if you're if you're if you're a fool. You can give the janitor the opportunity to be a CEO. You want to be a fool? Do it. But Hashem is not a fool. You're not going to give the janitor the job of CEO, at least not on day one. Why? Because he doesn't have the skills of a CEO. He has the skills of a janitor. If he wants to build himself up to become the CEO, he's more than welcome to. And I know a few people that used to be janitors and became CEOs and became very, very successful. 
you can build yourself up and just like you can build yourself up in the business world needless to say you can build yourself up in the spiritual world if you are born a non-jew and you want to serve Hashem at the highest level as a non-jew you can become a righteous noahide if you want to serve Hashem at the highest possible level period you have to become a righteous jew end point there is no other way you cannot be more righteous uh, a, uh, as a non-jew then you can be more righteous as a jew now of course a righteous non-jew is much better than a wicked jew a righteous noahide is much better than a wicked jew a wicked jew is the worst thing in creation but again we're talking about jews that are wicked on purpose that are you know not just people that are clueless and don't even know what judaism is we're talking about people that are completely aware that god exists completely aware that torah exists and they're still going against the torah those people are bottom of the barrel the worst of the worst they're the ones that are, that are creating all the problems in the world but the the the, uh, the uh, non-jew that's a righteous jew it's much better than that uh, than that wicked uh, uh jew much better but if you compare the best of the non-jews versus the uh the, the best of the jews there's no comparison simply no comparison and it's the reason why we try to help people convert if it's possible but again people think that conversion is supposed to be easy people think that it's like uh this hand holding uh, uh process that you're gonna do everything for them and it's just like going to the you know uh department of it of of uh of driving or something uh the department of motor vehicles where you go there you give them a little fee you get a license and hey, hey uh, congratulations mazel tov you're a jew it doesn't work that way to become a jew is a process a learning process a uh a life changes and uh if your conversion is very very easy there's usually something wrong it's all process and a person needs to understand that it, a person needs to understand that and the person understands that becoming a jew is a privilege by the time they convert they not only love the fact that they're becoming a jew but they also love the jewish people if you don't love the jewish people you should not become a jew you should not even try to become a jew you have to understand to to, to to become a jew means that you love the jewish people both the religious ones and the clueless ones because they have potential to become religious but needless to say a person that thinks that everybody is the same is not of that mentality and many times those people become anti-semitic many times they become anti-semitic and of course all of the nazis that like to watch my shirim they like to clip these types of uh, sections of the lectures and put it on their channels oh you see this rabbi is saying the jews are better that's racism call it racism call it whatever you want jews are better just a reality but only if they're righteous jews and guess what history proves it history proves it history proves that the righteous jews are the best people in history simple there's nobody to compare there's nobody to compare and you know what even logic compares it even logic compares it ask any person ask any person if you were in a foreign place middle of nowhere at scary as can be scary as can be your car breaks down it's dark there's no light it's uh i don't know whatever is scary to you i don't know whether it's a forest and grasses and animals and whatever it's hell on earth you pulled over you have nowhere to go it's not even close to being morning and it's scary and you hear sounds and all types of things who would you prefer to have to pull over next to you and say hey you need some help a guy that looks like asher meza or a guy that looks like me who would you prefer to pull over next to you a guy that uh, uh you know is a uh, uh some nazi some lefty liberal some uh some secular asian guy or a religious jewish guy who would you prefer to say hey listen i'm here to help you who, who would you prefer every normal human being would prefer the religious jew why because they know those religious jew no matter what you think of their of their of their practices those jews they have values they have values that society admires they have values they have ways they have teachings that are admirable they have teachings that are something that has really shaped the world so to say that everybody's the same is simply stupidity so part of us not being the same 
with the non-Jews is that Hashem treats us with a, a different uh, different formula. If a Jew makes a lot of mistakes but then decides to repent, Hashem could literally wipe out all of the bad. Doesn't automatically happen, doesn't easily happen, but nonetheless, it can happen. A non-Jew gets an opportunity to go to heaven, but they ha- still have to pay a very serious price for their, their, their mistakes. That's one of the things. There's also other things. There, the uh, the d- judgment on a uh, Jew is manyfold, meaning that there are many more things that the Jew gets judged for because we have more responsibility. But the judgment is more harsh on the non-Jew. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a simple reality. Uh, if, uh, if a Jew steals uh, and gets caught, he has to pay back what he stole plus another, meaning he has to pay double. If a non-Jew gets caught stealing according to the Torah it's a death penalty how much does he have to steal to get a death penalty a penny a penny it's death penalty uh another thing that will I'm sure drive some of you crazy and uh when I heard it my brain fell out of my head but it's a reality a uh if a uh Jew if a Jew is a uh uh has an abortion Abortion is murder, but it's not mamash murder in a sense that you're killing a, uh, a, a person like you're killing in the middle of the street, but nonetheless, it's murder. You're killing a living person. You're killing. It's a sin. It's against the Torah, but it's not the same judgment as if you're killing somebody that's walking, that's in the real world. It's, if so, if a person commits murder, but t- a Jew commits murder of a baby, by uh, having an abortion it's a very very hefty punishment but it's not a death penalty it's a very heavy punishment and hopefully they do tshuva for it but it's not a death penalty according to most chachamim but a non-jew a non-jew that has an abortion death penalty why because a non-jew is obligated by the noahide laws and noahide laws are a uh, there's a, there's a law Maram Sanhedrin, page 57 uh, talks about the uh, judgment of, uh, of uh, uh, Noahide in regards to uh, abortions and uh, you'll see that uh, the judgment is seems seems like it's more severe on the non-Jew and in fact it is it is on that particular uh, on that particular uh, aspect uh and uh it doesn't mean that a jew is allowed to have an abortion they'll get punished for it but it's not a death penalty but a non-jew that has an abortion it's a death penalty now again we don't kill anybody today because we don't have a sanhedrin all of the death penalties that are in the world today are heavenly death penalties meaning hashem pretty much uh owes that person one owes that person one and sometimes uh, a lot more than one but nonetheless, the, the, uh, because the non-Jew has a uh, different uh, responsibility in the world, he also has less favoritism. Simple. It's just like uh, you would judge your son versus, uh, I don't know, some, somebody else's son. Simple. Uh, you can say, no, but everybody's Hashem's sons. No, everybody's Hashem's creation. But only the Jewish people are sons. Only Jewish people are sons. That's the only one that they call it, it his children. Everybody's his creation, but the ones that he actually took ownership of as far as that's his children is Am Yisrael. So it's a reality. So again, it's a, uh, will the uh, Nazis and the anti-Torah people make a clip out of this? Most likely. Will we care? Absolutely not. Will this create anti-Semitism? Absolutely not. Why? Anti-Semitism already exists before I said this. If they want to use the truth of the Torah, in order to uh, magnify their anti-Semitism, let them do whatever they want to do. It doesn't bother us at all. Our obligation is to treat, it, is to teach the Torah, and those that want to use it for light, let them. Those that want to use it as a uh, something to stumble upon and make more sins, let them do that too. As it says in the Gemara, "Abali ter mesein biado, abali tame putchim lo." Somebody that comes to become, uh, looks to become purified, Hashem gives them a hand. Someone that looks to become impure, makes more sins, Hashem opens the entire door for them. Yeah, get out of here. Go. Do whatever you want. I don't want to see you. 
Want to make more sins as a result of a dog? Go ahead, do it. And that's a reality. Now again, person can accept it, can reject it, can do whatever they want. But this is the truth and no one can deny it. And Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, for those righteous people that accept it, whether they're righteous Noahides or righteous Jews or converts or whatever it is, it's praiseworthy as the person that accepts the truth for what it is. Uh, how can learning Torah improve one's character traits and learn writing proper speech huh? and help prevent degenerative brain illnesses uh, like dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's? Uh, okay, well, I mean, it depends. It depends how uh, developed a person is and how much uh, damage there is. Uh, if you see on our uh, channel, there is a uh, video of uh, uh, Rav uh, Chaim Kachlon, Rav Chaim's father, of uh, he being interviewed by uh, uh, by Hidabrut, I believe, a uh, special show, and also his student and his student's mother being interviewed there. And uh, that student was uh, born with Down syndrome. Now, in, in society today, when a child is born with Down syndrome, what do people do? How do they treat it? They treat it by putting that Down syndrome kid with other Down syndrome kids. And what ends up happening? They stay the same and get worse most of the time. They usually don't improve over time. They usually don't improve over time. But Rav Ephraim and uh, Rav Ephraim's father, Rav Chaim, uh, is not a uh, typical uh, psychologist. He's a Talmud Chacham. And he knows that Torah is cure for everything. And he took this kid that has Down syndrome, that his, uh, the, the, the woman that adopted him is, in essence, his mother, uh, she says that when she adopted him, he was like the worst of the worst, tongue hanging out, uh, really, really difficult to look at. She sacrificed her whole life to work on this kid, taking him to all types of uh, classes, uh, you know, for, for to help him with uh, speech, to help him with this, to help him with that, but most importantly, Torah. And she took him to Rav Chaim Kachlon. Rav Chaim Kachlon took this kid, did not treat him differently, he put them in a kollel, like everybody else. Like everybody else. Chiu, he is part of like everybody else. Didn't treat him differently. Asks questions like everybody. Confused like everybody. Uh, looking like everybody. And guess what? Today, he has almost completed the shas. He's almost finished with the shas. He's almost finished with the shas. He's already finished at the time of the interview. He completed 17 masechtot of the shas. I believe if he could complete a few more since then. He's very close to completing the entire shas bavli. An undertaking that most people on the earth have not done and he is a very normal person. I mean, of course, he still looks the way he looks, but functional. And why? Because he did not keep him where society says you should keep him, with other people like him. Like they treat, you know, people that have illnesses like uh, as if they're like, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, sadness and horrible and you can't uh, do anything about it. So... Let's just put them, you know, together with people like them. Well, you know, you put the mice with the mice, you put the rabbits with the rabbits, you put the chickens with the chickens, and you put the people that are sick with other people that are sick. Now, again, at times it's necessary, but not all the time, and especially a, uh, if, uh, if, if you're willing to invest and you, you have somebody that's willing to do it, you can convert a person uh, and transform them through the Torah. And you see how this young man became a Talmid Chacham. A Talmid Chacham knows Allah, knows a, uh, how to learn Gemara, knows Torah. And all day he learns, all day he does Chesed, fantastic human being. And I've met others like him. I've met others like him. There was one uh, very, very impressive young man named Moshe that I met in uh, Boca Raton. Uh, also has a, uh, uh, has a Down syndrome, but this kid was like amazing. Amazing, really good kid, special kid, and uh, and and again, very gifted. But again, it's a didn't come with without a price. So if a person uses the Torah like it's supposed to be used, that Torah can heal all wounds, all wounds. 
And we have examples in the Gemara of how it heals people that have uh, physical problems, visual problems, uh, all, uh, any type of problem. Torah can heal everything. And we have major Chachamim, like the Chazonish, that was literally able to tell surgeons how to operate on the brain, despite the fact that he never learned medicine in his life. Torah has all of the wisdoms in it. The question is, do people really listen? Because sometimes there are people that they just want something quick. Oh, Rabbi, can you just give me a blessing and everything will be fixed? doesn't work that way. doesn't work that way. Anything of any value comes with a price. Comes with a price. Comes with sacrifice. The things that come easy are usually bad for you. Well, almost done, Rabbi uh, How was David Melech allowed to let go of his honor as king in the episode of Shimi ben Gera? Uh, how is he allowed to go? I mean, he's the king. You're not supposed to uh, uh, forsake uh, your, uh, your honor as a king, but uh, Hashem saw that it wasn't him forsaking his honor, but rather his true emunah in Hashem. That when Shimi ben Gera cursed him, a klalani mretzit, uh, one of the uh, one of the soldiers of, of David the Melech wanted to kill Shimi ben Gera, but uh, David the Melech truly understood the emet in the whole thing, which was that although Shimi ben Gera cursed me, he would not been allowed to curse me had I not done something to deserve that curse. Don't be upset at him at all. He's simply a vessel that Hashem is using to rebuke me, and at that moment. Uh, David the Melech literally understood the purpose of creation. And Hashem elevated him as a result of that to be the fourth carrier of the Merkava, of the Shechina. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, David. That's when it uh, officially happened, at that moment, because he officially understood the purpose of everything. How Hashem, in essence, uh, is, is, is running the world as far as, uh, you know, Emunah and Hashem, the reward and punishment and so on. Uh, so it wasn't forsaking his honor, but rather was his dveikut in Hakadosh Baruch Hu, dveikut in Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, Shaul Melech, on the other hand, uh, although he was also humble, he uh, made a mistake in forsaking his honor, and he got punished for it. Uh, but that's because that his forsaking of honor wasn't quite the same of uh, level as David Melech. Although Shaul Melech was a tzaddik, kadosh, and uh, we cannot even be the, uh, the the dust under his feet. The Gemara says, Gemara says, and that's the only reason I'm allowed to say it, is that uh, that was a, uh, you know, he, he made a mistake in essence with uh, him forsaking his honor, I believe, twice. Uh, I was offered a thousand dollars a day contract job uh, Monday through Friday, but I asked if I was going to have to work Friday night, and they said, yes, it's in the contract. I declined the invitation. If you're Jewish, Chazaka uh, Bucha. Good for you that you are not working on Shabbat. But if you're not Jewish, there's really no reason for you not to work on Friday night. I mean, if it's a good job, it's a kosher job, there's no reason for you not to work Friday night. I, I don't know from your name whether you're Jewish or not Jewish. Uh, but if you're not Jewish, uh, there's no reason for you to give up that job. But if you're Jewish, then of course, Chazakah Bucha, it's a big mitzvah. How do we know, al how do we know when to test Hashem on this mitzvah and give all for Torah? Uh, a person does not need to give all for Torah. The, the examples of giving all for Torah are people that uh, usually it's a, uh, it's a situation where either the person doesn't have much to give, so really all they have is, 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 is a, uh, like this kid. He only had one coin. Uh, all he had was very, very little, so, and anything less would be too insignificant. Uh, or there's simply a time of, uh, you know, uh, desperation, meaning that if you don't give, it'll, uh, it'll uh, go to, you know, be destruction of a Torah in some way or another. Uh, so again, it's generally speaking, the, uh, the rules are as follows, where a person is, uh, needs to give at least 10% of their income to uh, Asma Asaf for the Torah, but if they uh, want to uh, uh, not only get protection of their money, but they also want uh, wealth, then they should give 20% of their income uh, for the sake of the Torah. 20% uh, of their income. But that's as long as they have a normal income. If they're extremely wealthy, meaning if they're making millions or they already have millions, then they can give all of their income uh, as a, uh, uh, for the Torah. Uh, same thing goes as far as staka. 
Tzedaka, uh, and but uh, you know, Tzedaka, they have to, everybody has to give at least a puta, at least a dollar, uh, you know, each year. But if a person has the means, he has to give more. Now, in regards to how much to give and how much not to give, each person has to uh, evaluate uh, their their uh, what they need and what they don't need. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, every person knows what they need, what they don't need. No one's asking you uh, to uh, to live like a uh, beggar. Uh, and in fact, it's not uh, it's not good to live like a beggar if uh, if you have the means to live uh, like a uh, you know wealthy person. Uh, because one of the things that Gemara says that a person needs in order to um, have uh, concentration in their learning of Torah, they need to have a wife that they're attracted to, uh, I mean, they're connected to her, they, uh, there's a connection there, they need to have uh, a uh, um, parnasa, they need to have ni- uh, a nice uh, dwellings, a place to live. So if a person has everything that they need, everything that they need, and uh, they're able to learn Torah without a problem, and they still have something left, then surely a person can give more. Uh, but if a uh, if a person is uh, um, you know is uh, doesn't have everything that he needs, he shouldn't starve himself just for the sake of uh, you know donating another ten dollars. Eat normal, sleep normal, learn normal. Uh, there's no need to starve yourself. But as far as to when to push yourself. Uh, you know, there is a, uh, this is one of those things where it's not applicable to everybody. Uh, meaning that this is only going to apply to a few of you. Uh, and, uh, if it doesn't apply to you, don't feel bad. It just means that you're normal. If it does apply to you, then, uh, uh praiseworthy is such a person. What is What am I talking about? There are certain people that they can't help themselves where when they see that there are simply not enough people learning Torah or that there's a risk that a uh, you know yeshiva or kola will be closed or that there are people that are you know righteous people that don't have food uh, and, and they simply can't help themselves there's certain there's something that's kosher and something that's good there's something that's holy in the world, but it doesn't have the means. And, they, and, and that person sees this and, 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 and or hears about it or is aware of it in some way or another, and they simply can't live with themselves. It like pains them. And they simply can't help themselves but to give. Those people should give and they will be blessed. Why? Because such a person is giving with the right intentions. They're not giving because they're looking for reward back they're giving simply because it's part of them it's part of them they have full emunah they're not asking Hashem for anything in return they're not uh simply they feel the nation's pain they feel the nation's pain and it's simply they're incapable of going to sleep at night without doing something about it there are some people like this uh and uh there are those people can do it no problem uh but this doesn't apply to most people uh, there's a Gemara that talks about how uh, one of the, uh, I think it was Rabbi Hanina, but one of the tzaddikim, literally, they were, he couldn't keep a dollar in his pocket. Anything that uh, he had, he would give it to the poor people. He would give it all to the poor people. And uh, I said, yeah, but what about you? He said, I have what I need. I have the food I need for today. Yeah, but what about tomorrow? He goes, tomorrow, tomorrow. I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And there are a few people like this where they feel the nation's pain. They feel the nation's pain. I know one person that uh, they uh, he heard about a uh, uh, now something that's happening now. I heard about a Rosh uh, Kolel Tamit Chacham that because of this whole situation that's happening in the world uh, is um, uh, the the Rosh Kolel is uh, have, struggling with money because he can't travel. Uh, so what's happening is that they're not able to meet the uh, deficit of the kolel uh, by almost 50% because the foreign donors are not able to donate for different reasons. There's all types of regulations and headaches and so on. It's also hard to transfer money overseas now. All types of crazy things are happening. In so many words, there's a very big test already for two years. He hasn't hasn't been able to travel to raise money. 
and the donations are literally half of what is necessary and uh, this other person doesn't uh, he's not like a uh, his Talmud he's not uh, uh, very wealthy simply another Jew that you know knows who this person is appreciates them there you know but nonetheless they're not it's not like a family it's not like somebody called them and asked them about it they just heard this person is struggling struggling a lot so it just bothered them bothered them a lot and they made a phone call listen what's going on what's what's happening over there can you find out and they found out so well, how much well, i don't know ask the rabbi so they got the rabbi on the phone what's this is it oh I, I made a commitment I, I, you know, what's called how much is it oh we're, we're short fifteen thousand dollars something like that per month a lot of money fifteen thousand dollars a month now this person is not rich and he uh told the uh the Rosh Kolev, okay hold on a second let me think I'll get back to you okay okay thank you very much uh, no I want to help you he said okay no problem I want to help said, thank you everybody said I want to help but okay thank you no 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 I'm gonna call you back I'm gonna think about it uh what I can do but I'm definitely gonna help you with something okay fine fine okay no problem said okay no it was like I don't know something like uh middle of the night call and uh Five minutes later called okay I'll take the whole thing what take who where what are you taking what do you do no the whole thing I'll do the whole thing I'll, whatever you need that $15,000 I'm gonna do it just give me a blessing that I'll be able to actually do it what, what do you mean you'll be able to do it I have enough money to give you this month middle of I'll have money next month but I don't know if I'm gonna have money next month. now a person like this is not doing it because he's looking for a reward he's not doing it because he's looking for some fame or he's looking for some he simply is pained that there is a Talmud Chacham and Avrichim and people that are suffering and simply can't tolerate it. And he just simply decides, I have to do something about it. Now, how many people in the world are like this? Not many. Not many. But there are. Both of them, some of them do exist. Some of them do exist. How is it going to turn out? I don't know. When I hear the next part of the story, I'll tell you. But uh, so far, all I heard is that part of the story. And. Uh, I know that uh, that person already has had some uh, miracles happen to them anyway, so I'm, I'm sure it's going to turn out okay. But uh, I've seen I've seen many many wonderful things of people that commit to Torah. I think I've told you guys stories in the past of one guy that uh, literally gave all of his money to an avrech to move, and then as as Hashem turned the world, he ended up losing all of his money, and uh, he had to move. And miraculously, a day before he had to move, somebody gifted them like fifty thousand dollars or some ridiculous amount of money which uh, is really what he needed in order to move and make a major change and so on so Hashem runs the world and the more a person has emunah and does good things the more of those who blesses them so as far as giving everything if a person can't help themselves that's one thing the uh, but if a person is going to be worried about it or calculating the time of when the blessing is coming don't give everything don't give everything there's no need for it you don't need to test and you, you won't stand the test uh, and it can easily break a person and cause them to become uh anti Hashem so just fulfill obligation at least 10 percent of income and whatever you can do in staka if you want to do more 20 percent of income and whatever you can do in staka these are two different mitzvot 20 percent of income and whatever you can do in staka otherwise there's no reason for you to to uh to to uh, uh bankrupt yourself uh but again I've seen a few people do it every single one of them had major miracles and extraordinary things happen in their life and uh, I'm sure certain things that they don't even realize happened uh, happened to them some people were supposed to die they're alive well have kids happy marriages some people were uh, supposed to uh, be sick some people are supposed to do this some people are supposed to do that people that I know that have done it or have heard that have done it made major sacrifices for the sake of Torah not necessarily always giving everything they have in some cases actually giving everything they have every single one of those stories eventually worked out in a huge miraculous way uh that uh, is no different than the story that uh that we just heard no different than the story that we just heard but uh, again a person does not need to force themselves uh, to be somebody that they're not doing what you're supposed to be doing is already a big thing it's already a big thing no need to push yourself into something that uh, that you're not but if you are one of those people praiseworthy person 
praiseworthy person. Uh, okay, Isaac is asking, I see a question, I'm not a rabbi, Torah is consciousness. No, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, oh, thank you very much there for posting the, uh, the, uh, the link. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael is asking, is the area underneath the overhang of a home's roof considered inside the house? Uh, considering if a Jew could carry something on Shabbat to the outside of the home, so as uh, so long as it remains under the roof i mean it depends uh, how big the overhang is i mean it's uh, uh i mean technically uh, going outside is reshut uh, rabim but uh, some people there uh it doesn't matter if they have overhang or no overhang it's a uh, the whole community uh is is a under roof that's not your typical roof but it's a different type of roof but Generally speaking, inside the house is inside the house, outside the house is outside the house. Um, but it's also what a person considers. It's also what a person considers. I would have to look at the overall actual picture of what's there, not just a uh, description of overhang. Can't give you an uh, answer on that, I'm sorry. Why is our nation so divided? I understand certain communities want to preserve their ancestors' customs and keep outsiders from marrying into them, but isn't that causing more division? What are your thoughts? Uh, for us to remain Jews, we have to keep outsiders out. Because if we allowed all of the non-Jews to come into the Jewish people, there wouldn't be any Jews left. So, if, yes, that's causing division, and that division is necessary for our survival. If we want to remain Jews, then we have to only stay with Jewish people uh, and marry Jewish people. But if, uh, if the Jewish people would continue marrying non-Jews at the rate that they're doing now in America at over 70% or 80% in, uh, in, in most places, uh, then uh, those, those people that are marrying non-Jews are simply one or two generations away from simply being eliminated and no longer being considered Jewish. So uh, the fact that the Jewish people that are authentic Jews, that are practicing the Torah, uh, are divided from the people is a necessity for our survival. All of the Jewish people that you see today are the descendants either one, two, three, fourth descendants, fourth generation descendants of righteous Jews that were righteous generation after generation for 3,000 plus years. Meaning the only reason why you are here today or I'm here today as a Jew is because for over 3,000 years, people were observing the Torah, keeping all of the mitzvot, keeping all of the Torah, doing everything that's necessary to do as far as their servitude of Hashem, needless to say, marrying only Jewish people in order for the grandkids to be Jewish, in order for the grandkids to be Jewish, in order for the grandkids to be Jewish, all the way for 3,300 plus years. All of those others for the last 3,000 years that didn't marry Jewish, they're not Jewish anymore. Their descendants are not Jewish anymore, so they're not part of our nation. They're not divided. They simply don't exist. They're no longer in the world. So the Jews of today are only here because of those righteous Jews that remain true to the Torah. The Jews today that are not observing the Torah, they're simply guaranteeing themselves that Judaism will no longer be part of their family within one or two generations, just like all of the others before them, all of the others before them that are simply no longer in the world. All the Jews of today are here because for the, for the most part, their, their uh, heritage comes from righteous people that were righteous for literally thousands of years and sacrificed their life for the sake of observing Shabbat. Sacrificed their life for the sake of observing the rabbinical mitzvot. Sacrificed their life for the sake of uh, eating kosher. Sacrificed their life for it. Sacrificed their life for the sake of avoiding intermarriage. Those Jews are the reason why Jews exist today. All of the secular people of the past they're not here anymore. They don't exist anymore. There is the, none of the, the seculars of today are related to the seculars of three, four hundred years ago. The seculars of today are newly secular, and if they don't do tshuva, they're one or two generations away from simply disappearing from the world as Jewish people. They'll be among the nations. They'll be among the Chinese. They'll be among the Germans. They'll be among the Americans. They'll be among all of the other nations, but they will have no connection whatsoever to the Jewish people and will not be considered Jewish whatsoever as if they never existed 
Uh, are you allowed to play poker in a casino? I know you're not allowed, but my husband's friend thinks it's okay because he sees Hasidic Jews playing there and he thinks it's allowed. It's 100% forbidden for a Jew to gamble, period. It's forbidden for a Jew to gamble. Needless to say, it's forbidden for a Jew to be in a place that's considered Moshav Letzim. Read the first Tehilim of, of David Melech. Praiseworthy is the person that does not associate with the wicked people that are, are involved in, in, a, in a place of, uh, of, of jokings and light-mindedness. Uh, now, a casino, uh, it doesn't always have to be an actual casino. It can even be a uh, card game in somebody's house. It's also considered Moshav Litzim. A Jew is not even allowed to be at such a place. Needless to say, a Jew is not allowed to be in a casino because that's not only Moshav Litzim and a place of gambling, it's also a place that has znut, has all the zonot, all the prostitutes, all the immorality of the world. It's 100% forbidden for a Jew to be inside such a place. It's Chilul Hashem. All of those people that pretend to be religious and you see them in casinos, those people, the only thing that they're winning themselves is, is a permanent punishment in Geinom for the sin of Chilul Hashem. The sin of Chilul Hashem the Gemara in Masechet Yoma says, there is no tshuva for it possible in this world. The tshuva begins with death. And what's the, uh, what's the punishment for it? Eternal gain on for Chilul Hashem. The only thing that a person can do in order to rectify Chilul Hashem is first of all stop and do a lot of Kiddush Hashem for the rest of their life. But those people that go to the casinos are that look religious, they are some of the worst, most despicable people on planet Earth. And uh, they cause a lot of Chilul Hashem. And it's not just in casinos, it's also in all types of clubs and in appropriate places. And those people are just wearing a costume, just like your children wear a costume on Purim and the Goim wear it on their idolatrous holiday of uh, Halloween. Those people are wearing a costume and they pretend to be Hasidic, they pretend to be observant Jews, but they're not Hasidic and they're not observant Jews. They're simply Reshaim that are pretending to be something else. But this you'll also find among the other nations some people that pretend to be righteous people and uh, they only to find out that they're uh, pedophiles. Some people that pretend to be generous only to find out that they're thieves. Some people that pretend to be uh, good and only to find out that this person's really evil. There's plenty of that all over the world, but needless to say, the punishment on those people, people the Jews, will be worse than all of those. The punishment on a Hasidic Jew that goes to a casino will be worse than Hitler's, just so you know that. The punishment on somebody that pretends to be Hasidic and goes to a casino and does all the filthy things that are done in a casino, and unfortunately from my past sins, I know what happens in a casino, all of those people will have a worse punishment than Hitler. Just so you know that. And you can tell those people and you can make a clip out of this and send it to them in my name. That's the punishment they're going to get. Why? Because they're doing Chilul Hashem. Hitler did not do Chilul Hashem. Hitler was a murderer, but he didn't desecrate Hashem's name. They're desecrating Hashem's name. And the punishment for desecrating Hashem's name is much, much worse than murder. Much, much worse. And so if your friend, your husband's friend, cousin, whoever it is, wants to have a worse punishment than Hitler, you can go there, enjoy, have a great time, and win all the punishment in the world. But if he's a smart person, if he's a clever person, he understands the language that I speak, then he's going to run away from such places like it's the plague. Like it's the plague, but not the plague like Corona. Plague like the Black Plague that killed people on sight. That's how you avoid the casino. That's how much you avoid the casino. Bezal Hashem, don't listen. Bezal Hashem, don't listen. Uh, that's it, guys. I need to get some more rest. I uh, I need to get some rest before my next shoe. I need to get my uh, rest before my next shoe. I have a shoe in Hebrew uh, coming up uh, soon. Bezal Hashem. So, Tizkulu uh, Mitzvot Rabot. Very good questions tonight. Ashrechev, Ashrechel Kechem. הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך אתכם בכל מכל כל, חיים ארוכים, שלמים, מלאים תורה, מצוות, גמילות חסדים, נחת וברכה. May all of you uh, have the, the strength, the, uh, the ability, the desire, the wherewithal uh, to do complete tshuva and to help all of those around you and all of those that are not around you. To do tshuva, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to, to serve Hashem uh, completely and to simply sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name day and night. Thank you for learning with me and Bezat Hashem, we'll see each other soon. Kol Tov.
בהמשך. אני מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו יזכירו ויצליחו, יזכירו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. אנחנו נמצאים בזמן שם רשת בכל הארץ. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעבירו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. אני